Regulatory Levies Amendment Bill 2019. It being 2 p.m., we will now move to questions without notice. I'll give ministers a time to reallocate themselves and call Senator Farrell. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. How has this government managed to uh, oversee a skills shortage and a wage stagnation at the same time? That the minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. I am actually trying to get to some notes, Mr. President, but uh, thank Mr. Farrell, uh, Senator Farrell very much uh, for his note. Sorry to demote you, uh, Senator Farrell. I didn't mean to, uh, to do that. I think it's uh, important to note, Mr. President, that uh, as a government we are absolutely committed to ensuring that Australians have the right skills for the workforce of today and, importantly, the workforce of the future. And we know that uh, our vet sector is, uh, is necessary to ensure that we can deliver those skills and that it is responsive to the needs of employers, of workers and of students. So, in the uh, current financial year, Mr. President, we're investing over three billion dollars yeah. in VET. Yeah. That uh, investment, Mr. President, is broken up by one and a half billion dollars. Well, they're not the wrong note, Senator, because if you listened to the uh, esteemed Senator's Order. question about skills, then you would know that is exactly what he asked. So, where are we investing, Mr. President? We're investing in the states and territories through the National Agreement on Skills and Workforce Development's specific purpose order. payments. Senator We're Payne, investing Senator in the Payne, sorry, Australian Senator, I have fund. Senator Watt on a point of order. Senator Watt, on relevance, Mr. President. Uh, the minister has not addressed the question whatsoever, which is that how have they managed to, at the same time, oversee skill shortages and wage stagnation? That is quite an achievement, and we're very uh, interested uh, in the Senator, answer. Senator, uh, Senator Cormann. Uh, on the point of order, I don't, I don't uh, think that points of orders are appropriately used to mislead the Senate. Uh, because if uh, Senator Watt had listened yesterday, he would know that uh, real wages growth is higher than it was Order. under Labor, uh, okay. and it's, a high, it's higher than it's been over the last Thank you, years. Senator Cormann. That is a, not, not a point of order. I remind all senators that a point of order on direct relevance is not an opportunity to simply restate the question. Senator Wong, can I finish what I've got to say, and then I'll call you? Um, it is not a, simply an opportunity. Please, I ask that a point of why the answer is allegedly not directly relevant be made rather than simply restating the question. Senator Wong, you sort the call. Well, Mr President, we have taken note of your exhortation not to simply repeat the question, but for the purposes of articulating a direct relevance point, it is necessary to reference the question. Senator Watt didn't simply reference the fact that the subject matter, i.e. school shortages and wage stagnation at the same time, was not a matter that the minister had gone to. Um, appreciate that, Senator Wong. Um, in, I'm listening carefully to the minister. I believe the material she is dealing with is directly related to the question. It may not be the answer in the form, the type or the substance of that sort by those asking it, but I think it is directly relevant. There are supplementary questions and a time to debate it after question time. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. I am absolutely happy to concede that my error in commencing my answer was to say that I reject the premise of the question from Senator Farrell, but it was very nice of Senator Watt to help Senator Farrell uh, with his remarks. So, most importantly, Mr. President, as I was indicating about our $3 billion investment in VET, the National Agreement, uh, the Skilling Australians Fund uh, and our own skills program, including employer incentives and support for Australian apprenticeships, and the list goes on. But most importantly, Mr President, I don't intend to take a lecture on skills from those officers, because we know that the decline in apprenticeship commencements began under the former Rudd-Gillard-Rudd government. We know that the greatest fall in apprentice numbers on record occurred in 2012-13, when the number of apprenticeship commencements fell by 85,000 in a single year. Why did that fall happen, Order. Mr President? Senator Payne. I'll, I'll tell you Senator, in a moment. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr President. I do have a uh, supplementary uh, question. Uh, is annual wages growth now better or worse than when this government came to office? 
Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And let me be quite clear. The Governor of the Reserve Bank, Philip Lowe, has said strong employment growth over the past year or so has led to a pickup in wages growth in the private sector. <laughs> Indicated that real wages grew by 0.7 per cent through the year to the June quarter, above the 20-year average of 0.6 per cent, and above the rate of 0.4 per cent through the year. Order. Of Senator when Watt, Labor I, Senator left Watt on a point of order. Senator, I have Senator Watt on a point of order. Senator Payne. Well, okay. She Senator finally Watt. got there. She find, I was going to say that relevance. The, the question. Order. Please the minister let me finally hear Senator got Watt. There. Order on my right. Order. She's the cat's mother. Order. Senator Watt. The minister finally got there. I was going to. My point of order was on relevance. The question is, was a comparison to when the government first came to office, and we hadn't heard anything about that. Um, I Senator Cormann on the point of order. Um, that was a frivolous point of order by Senator Watt. Uh, minister, the, the minister was clearly directly relevant to the question asked. Directly relevant. I, Senator Wong, I will take your submission. Thank you. On the, I think the leader of the government's point of order, who seems to now simply be dismissing every point of order that the opposition has, there is something in the standing orders called direct relevance. If the, if the government doesn't want points of orders on it, perhaps their ministers could be directly relevant to the question. I, on, on the point of order raised by Senator Watt, conceding his opening statement, um, I do, however, believe that the minister, by talking about wages growth, was directly relevant to the question. Again, I ask senators, I cannot instruct a minister how to answer a question. If the minister is talking about wages growth in the context that she was, I believe that is directly relevant to the question. Senator Payne. Thank you very much. And, uh I was saying, Mr. President, that real wages grew by 0.7 per cent through the year to the June quarter. It was above the 20-year average of 0.6 per cent, above the rate of 0.4 per cent through the year of growth when Labor left office. Indeed, average weekly ordinary time earnings for full-time adults rose by 3.1 per cent over the past year, which is the strongest growth in six years, Mr. President. On the 30, we know that, Mr. President. The opportunity to respond to the question is somewhat limited by a pale imitation of former Senator Doug Cameron sitting Order. on the other side. Senator Payne. Who, oh. pale Senator Wong. Mr. President, I, 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 Senator Watt. I could invite the minister to withdraw. I would make the point this minister has a habit when she's under pressure of going personal, Order. of going personal Order. and grow up. You're the foreign Senator, minister. Senator Wong, grow up. please. Senator pale Wong. imitation. Senator Wong. Senator Order, I'll call. I will call Senator Cormann. Um, you know, again, uh, Senator, Senator Wong is again Order. misleading. I can't even hear Senator Cormann, which is, is truly spectacular given his voice and how close I am to him. S Senator, Senator, Cormann. Senator Wong is clearly misleading the Senate. That was a strong and very effective answer that the minister gave, which was directly Order. relevant to the question asked. All right. All right. First of all, I'm going to rule on the point that Senator, Senator Wong made. Um, if senators don't like banter across the chamber, they shouldn't start it by interjecting. And I might say, neither the former senator referred to nor the one currently referred to, I think, took it as an insult. Um, so I will now move to Senator Farrell's final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I do have a further supplementary question. Uh, given the Reserve Bank of Australia says wages growth has been abnormally weak and lower than average across all industries and states. Why does the government continue to refuse to reverse cuts to penalty rates? Yeah. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I'm not sure that Senator Farrell heard my previous quote of Governor Phil Lowe, who said the strong employment growth over the past year or so has led to a pick-up in wages growth in the private sector. And I do think it is important to quote the Governor of the Reserve Bank accurately. What I won't also take, Mr President, is a lecture from those opposite on the economy, because we know that as a result of our economic plan, as a result of our budget management, we're going to be able to return the budget to balance and into surplus for the first time in 11 years. Those opposite would not be familiar with that concept, Mr President. I understand that, but we also are very, very cognisant of the fact that there are significant headwinds, that the uh, economies the world over are facing challenges, and we are being prudent and careful in our management of the economy, led by the Treasurer, led by the Finance Minister, and Australians are 
looking forward, Mr. President, with the opportunities that are ahead, including job creation, which is, of course, a key fundamental of Order. our economic plan and our record. Order. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Can the minister outline how the Liberal National Government is building resilience by supporting the development of Australia's critical mineral and rare earth industries? And what would this mean for my home state of Western Australia? Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator O'Sullivan for his question. I recognise his strong support of the mining industry, particularly in his great state of Western Australia. We have a fantastic resources industry in this nation, a lot of it in Western Australia, and we have huge opportunities in the future, uh, Mr. President, in, the, in critical minerals and rare earths, as Senator O'Sullivan outlined. Now, what are critical minerals first? Well, they're those minerals that are, that are, that are essential. Uh, to, to the development of a modern economy. They are in many of the things that we feel and touch almost every day and that are changing our lives almost every day. Every smartphone has an enormous numbers, number of critical minerals. Def modern defence technologies have them, and renewable energy too has lots of rare earths and critical minerals. So if you do not support the mining industry, uh, Mr President, you are not supporting uh, a modern economy. If you do not support the mining industry, you do not support renewable energy. Shame. Now, what are we doing, Mr. President, in the light of this massive opportunity for our nation? Well, uh, earlier this year, with the Minister for Trade and Investment, Minister Birmingham, I released the government's uh, uh, strategy uh, to develop our critical minerals uh, industry. It is focused around three areas: uh, building the infrastructure we need to connect up to some of these new mining opportunities that are often away from. Uh, from other economic development to other, other economic uh, activity. Uh, so we're building uh, roads like Karratha to Mount Tom Price to open up uh, those opportunities in Senator O'Sullivan's part of the world, as, long, as, well, as well as with lots of other investment. We're investing in innovation. We've put forward $25 million to establish a future batteries uh, cooperative research centre, which will particularly look at those minerals in the battery sector. Uh, lithium, nickel, cobalt, and supporting not just the development of the mining opportunities in those, but also the downstream value-adding opportunities for Australia as well. And we are seeking to attract investment in this sector, and we know that's how to build our resources sector, to remain open to investment, attract those dollars so we can get jobs going in our country. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Minister, Australia holds some of the world's richest stocks of critical minerals and rare earths. Uh, what is the export potential of Australia's critical minerals and rare earths. Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, uh, Mr. President, as I was saying, we are blessed with those, uh, the rich uh, supplies uh, and deposits of, of these minerals. We are already the world's largest lithium producer. In fact, we've trebled production in eight years in Australia. Remarkable growth, uh, an industry largely uh, located in, in Senator O'Sullivan's home state. Uh, we are the second largest producer of rare earths in the world, and we have lots of cobalt. We haven't produced much yet, but we have lots of it here, and there's increased demand for it. In fact, we've got a lot. We're probably one of the countries with the richest diversity of these types of minerals. The United States government has identified 35 different minerals critical to their economy. We are in the top five for world production of 14 of those, and uh, that fact has led off discussions uh, with the U.S. administration. The Prime Minister held discussions with the President in the last month about that. We've agreed to have a high-level meeting in the United States next month to discuss a joint strategy here, how we can work together. Uh, to guarantee the supply of these minerals and, of course, to help our own two economies grow and develop. Senator O'Sullivan, final supplementary question. Minister, how important are critical minerals and rare earths to our modern economy? Senator Canavan. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, as I was saying uh, briefly in my answer to the first question, uh, these types of minerals are in basically everything. In every smartphone, there's around 25 different uh, minerals uh, and metals. It is more metallurgically complex than a uh, than a coal-fired power station, for example, which has about 10 or 11 different minerals and metals in it. Uh, a solar panel has about 16 different minerals and metals in, in a solar panel, and wind, uh, wind turbines have enormous quantities of rare earths. So, Mr. President, you cannot build these things uh, without the development of these uh, these minerals. And uh, while we uh, uh, we take for granted the ease of access and convenience of these modern technologies, they all get their start back. Uh, outdoors, uh, people who like to wear bright colours, uh, digging stuff up out of the ground uh, and doing that job so that we can enjoy uh, the modern life that we do. Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Businesses, Senator Cash. 
In question time yesterday, Senator Chandler asked the minister how a strong vocational education system is critical to running a strong economy. Why did the minister fail to advise Senator Chandler that on this government's watch, the number of apprentices and trainees in Tasmania has fallen by 1,190, a drop of more than 12 per cent? Order. The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I really did thank Senator Chandler yesterday uh, for what was an outstanding question on policy and policy that is, in fact, Order. important to the economy. Uh, Senator Polly, you may not be aware, but I think that this was articulated exceptionally well by the Minister for Foreign Affairs. On this side of the chamber, let me assure you, we will not take lectures from Labor when it comes to order. skills. Senator Cash, Senator Polly, on a point of order. Relevance, Mr. President. Uh, the minister is not being relevant to the question that was asked of her. Um, I'm, listening I, 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 I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. She has 91 seconds remaining. I believe at this point she is being relevant to part of the question asked, but I'm listening carefully. She has 91 seconds to complete her answer. Senator Cash. Thank you very much. And in relation to Tasmania, actually, the Premier, oh, Jeremy Rockcliffe, the Minister for Education, uh, recently issued a press release in June of this year saying Tasmania has outperformed the nation in apprenticeships and traineeship commitment under the Hodgman Liberal government. But again, Mr. President, on this side Order. of the chamber, we will not take lectures from those who were last Order. in government. Senator, Senator Cash, Senator Watt, on a point of order. On, on, on relevance, Watt. Mr. President, the minister's answer has not addressed the drop in apprenticeships and traineeships whatsoever. That was the point of the question, not anything else. No. The, the yeah. drop in apprenticeships and traineeships. That was the subject of the question. Senator Cormann, on the uh, point of order. On the point of order, uh, Minister Cash was directly relevant. The question uh, started off by referencing a question by Senator Chandler yesterday, uh, and that self-evidently makes self-evidently makes the order. response of the minister entirely directly relevant. Um, on the point, also, Senator White, I did just hear, and if I'm in error, I will correct myself in the future. I did just hear the minister refer to some numbers in Tasmania. Again, I cannot instruct the minister how to answer a question, but if the minister is answering the question asked, by, and that answer includes references to numbers in Tasmania quoted from a different source, I believe that is directly relevant. The number in, in the example the minister used, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. As I said, and thank you to Senator Watt actually for that interjection, because colleagues would know that it is because of Senator Watt visiting seats in Tasmania that they only uh, in sorry Queensland. Order, Senator Long, oh. on a point of order. Queensland. The, the direct, uh, I, but the point of order is direct relevance. The question goes to the 12 per cent order, drop Senator in Cash. Tasmanian apprenticeships. Why did she not advise Senator Chandler of that, given she asked the question about Tasmanian traineeships? I I believe the minister, while interrupted mid-sentence there, I didn't get to hear her conclusion, but I believe the minister is being directly relevant at the moment. Senator Cash. Referring to Senator Watt's great interjection, and I was thanking Senator Watt for all the work he did in Queensland to ensure that they only delivered one senator to the Australian Senate and also comprehensively lost the election. Perhaps it was because you were talking about Order. skills. Senator, sorry, I've got Senator Polly. Uh, Senator Polly was uh, Senator Wong. Mr. President, do I even need to take a point of order? I, I, that I, you, 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 don't, you can't instruct a minister how to answer a question. She deliberately ignored the previous point of order and went on on a rant that has nothing to do with the um, question. Could I, you I, please, please don't yell at me on this order. point? Please order. don't. The, the, the president should, with due respect, Mr. President, my submission is you should remind the minister of the question. It is a farce to have her going off on a rant when she's asked a question about Tasmanian apprenticeships. We care about those on this side. Order. Senator Cormann on the point of order. Yep. Well, in that contribution by Senator Wong just now, uh, where she refers to a, uh, ignorance of a point of order, she failed to acknowledge that you ruled that there was no point of order. All right, firstly, Senator, Senator Wong— on... Direct relevance. I ask you to rule. Okay. 
Firstly, I do insist that points of orders are raised. I do not consider it my role to be policing the answers of ministers on a rolling brief from the chair. So, Senator Wong, I do ask points of order be raised. Um, on the point of order there, um, I would remind the minister of the question. I would also remind the, all others in the chamber that while interjections are always disorderly, and I say that commonly at this time of the day, um, if people interject, they can respect a retort from the minister answering the question as well. So I'm not going to rule the minister was out of order because the minister was responding to an interjection. But, I, but multiple interjections, Senator Wong, I think. Um, Senator Wong. Mr President, with respect, that was her justification in the previous point of order. She then went on after you ruled where there, there was no further interjection on the same well, point. It, it is a farce. If I am incorrect, incorrect in not, I, I thought I heard further interjections. If I am incorrect on that, I'll review the video. I apologise, but I thought I heard further interjections. Well, Senator Cormann. Uh, on that point of order, the reality is that Senator Cash was entirely directly relevant to the question asked, except that she was constantly interrupted by frivolous points of order that weren't points of order and interjections and persistent interjections. I'm going to interpret the minister's comment on a state other than that raised in the question was actually in response to an interjection on multiple occasions. That is my memory of it. If I'm incorrect, I will apologise tomorrow after I watch the video because I doubt Hansard would have caught it all. Other than that, I actually think the minister was being directly relevant. If people don't want ministers to go off on a tangent, I think the minister was being directly relevant. I ruled so when she was talking about Tasmanian apprentice numbers from a different source, being the state government, than the one quoted in the question from Senator Polly. Senator Wong. Mr. President, is your ruling that you remind the minister of the question, or is your ruling that she was directly relevant? Because if it is the latter, there is an issue with that. The minister cannot possibly, in my submission, and I'd invite you to take advice, be directly relevant to a question in her portfolio when talking about the election and Queensland seats. And my point I made, Senator Wong, is I don't consider that material to be directly relevant. I do consider it to be a response to multiple interjections. And while they're always disorderly, I'm not going to say ministers cannot respond to them when people do not respond to my call for order in the chamber. I have reminded the minister of the question, but I have also ruled her substantive answer, for which a point of order was raised, was directly relevant because she was quoting from a different source about the exact same issue, which was, I believe, the number of apprentices in Tasmania that was contained in Senator Polly's question. So I'll call the minister to continue her answer, ask for no interjections and ask for the discussion to not range north of Bass Strait for a little while. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And as I was saying, um, if those on the other side actually cared about apprentices, they may wish to ask themselves: When we introduced the apprentice wage subsidy, it was actually opposed by those on the other side. If you actually cared about getting more people into apprenticeships, you would actually back the government's skills agenda and in excess of half a billion dollar commitment to ensure that Australians are trained for the jobs of today and for the jobs of tomorrow. Senator Polly, a supplementary question. Mr President, in her answer yesterday, why did the minister fail to advise Senator Chandler that under this government there have been more people dropping off are out of apprenticeships and traineeships, then finishing them. Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr. President. In responding to Senator Chandler yesterday, one of the issues I did point out to her was why we have had to rebuild the TAFE system, the school system, except for the apprentice system in Australia. And again, it is a direct result of the failures by those opposite when they were last in government. Mr President, as Senator Payne articulated to the chamber, those on the other side left a legacy that comprehensively ripped the guts out of vocational education and training in Australia. In fact, I believe Senator Wong actually sat around the cabinet table when decisions were made to gut over $1.2 billion from employer incentives over just two years. We are committed to vocational education and training in Australia. And Order, Senator Cash. Senator Polly, a final supplementary question. President, while Tasmania is suffering 
with the second highest unemployment in the nation and the lowest mean household income in the nation, this Order. government has slashed $3 billion from TAFE and training. Why did the minister fail to advise Senator Chandler that under her government, Australia has 150,000 fewer apprentices and trainees? Senator Cash. Thank you very much. Because, Mr. President, I was explaining to Senator Chandler why, yet again, we have had to step in as a government and clean up the legacy that those opposite left. You rip $1.2 billion of employer incentives out of the system. Do you know what actually happens, Mr. President? Do you know what happens? As Senator Payne clearly stated, the greatest fall in apprenticeship numbers on record occurred in 2012-13, Mr President, when the number of apprenticeship commencements fell by 85,000 in one single year. Senator Polly, perhaps your question is better directed to Senator Wong, because Senator Wong was actually sitting around the Cabinet table at the time making decisions to rip out of the system $1.2 billion in employer incentives. We are committed to this system, Mr President, and we will do everything— Order, Senator that Cash. Senator Hanson-Young. Order. Senator Hanson-Young. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The Murray-Darling Basin is environmental collapse after years of mismanagement. We're facing a climate emergency, which will make, of course, droughts worse and more severe. Last summer, we saw mass fish kills. Even just in the last 48 hours, we've seen another one in the Menindee Lakes. Towns have run out of clean drinking water, and farmers cannot afford to buy water for their stock and crops. In response, the federal government, with their New South Wales colleagues, has decided to spend public money on building dams while overriding environmental and economic assessment. Building dams, Mr President, won't make it rain. And New South Wales, because of their laws, shows that even if these dams are built, water allocation rules means that the water won't be used for the community or the environment. All evidence shows public money for these dams will only deliver water for big corporate irrigators. Will the government release your cost-benefit analysis, or haven't you bothered to do it? Before, before I call Senator Cormann, can I urge all senators, while a minute is granted for questions, 70, Standing Order 73-1A does contain some guidelines around the role of statements and effectively preambles to questions. And I would urge senators to keep that in mind because it reads statements of fact or names of persons unless they are strictly necessary to render the question intelligible and can be authenticated shall not be contained in questions. I urge all senators to keep that in mind when they are considering preambles. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. Uh, the first point is that the government is, of course, absolutely committed to delivering the My Darling Bison Plan uh, and uh, ensuring that the ensuring benefits flow to communities, uh, farmers uh, and the uh, environment. Uh, when it comes uh, to the uh, questions in relation to uh, uh, dam infrastructure, the Bison Plan sets, of course, sustainable diversion limits, which are how much water can be used in the Murray Darling Basin while leaving enough water to sustain the nat natural environment. Basin state governments are responsible uh, for allocating water and they determine the maximum amount of surface and groundwater that can be uh, extracted from the uh, river system. Basin order. governments. Senator Hanson Young, if you're rising on a point of order on direct relevance, I urge you to consider it was a very broad minute-long question. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. I accept that, so I was going to make it simple. The question was, uh, will, the, will the government release the full cost-benefit no, analysis Senator, of these Senator proposals? Senator Hanson Young, with all due respect, with a preamble like that, you don't get to pick out the words at the end and restate that's the question. The minister can be directly relevant to any part of the question asked. You had an extensive preamble. The minister is entitled to be directly relevant to any part of that. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I thank you for that ruling. And I would again uh, say that the government is committed to delivering the Murray Darling Basin Plan uh, in full, ensuring, ensuring that the benefits flow to communities, farmers, and the environment. And I would also point out that the plan is a product of collaboration and cooperation uh, you know, between the federal government and relevant Basin. Uh, state uh, governments. And in that context, I was also making the point that Bison governments may choose 
uh, to build new infrastructure or make changes to existing infrastructure, for example, uh, raising dam walls to store more water and improve water security for basin communities. That is entirely uh, consistent with the plan. New or expanded dams don't create water, but rather intercept and store large volumes of water, which can then be managed as regulated releases. The Murray-Darling Basin Authority is required to ensure that state governments are using no more than the long-term annual average limit of water that can be taken from individual catchments within the basin. This requires that state governments have taken the maximum level of water use into consideration in any new development proposals. Any new infrastructure in the basin would need to be filled and used by entitlement volume within the sustainable diversion limits, and all new dams will require the necessary environmental development, cultural heritage and other approvals from relevant government authorities. That this is not, there is not a regulatory responsibility Order, for Senator the Murray Darling Basin Authority Senator to approve new dams. Senator Hanson-Young on a supplementary question. Th thank you, Mr President. I listened very carefully to the minister's response. And given your response, Minister, whose water allocation under the Murray-Darling Basin Plan will be cut as a result of water being taken out by these new dams? Will it come from small farmers, towns or the environment? Because we know it won't be coming for your big corporate irrigator mates. Senator Cormann. Uh, well, thank you. I completely reject the premise of the question, and clearly uh, Senator Hanson Young uh, did not listen uh, to my detailed answer, which uh, made the point that new or uh, expanded dams uh, don't create water, but rather intercept and store large volumes of water, which can then be managed as regulated releases. And that the and, and I also uh, made the point that, of course, uh, all of this, all of this uh, water that is stored within dams uh, need to be filled and used by entitlement volume within the sustainable diversion limits. So this is not about this is not a matter of somehow taking more water. It is a matter of storing the water that is available to ensure it can be used more effectively at the appropriate time. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Um, isn't it true, uh, Minister, that the government's drought response, far from being a plan, is simply abandoning economics and the environment, and the only plan the government's got is to pray for rain? Senator Cormann. Uh, th th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. I completely reject the premise of this question. I mean, we've got families, and, and it's actually it's, it's a rather offensive question. Uh, we've got rural families and communities around Australia suffering from the impact of the drought, and you know, this government is standing shoulder to shoulder with those families and those communities. And, and you know, we have appreciated the level of bipartisan support for many of the efforts that we've put in place. Let me, let me just say, let me just say that, that is a completely outrageous proposition, and I reject the premise of the question. Uh, we uh, have a very ambitious plan to support uh, drought-affected communities uh, now and into the future, building drought resilience into the future, uh, and we are absolutely focused on uh, doing the right thing in our public interest, in the national interest uh, at this difficult time, and also uh, building, yeah. building the necessary infrastructure uh, to secure a better future. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister please update the Senate on how a strong economy and strong budget will help Australia reduce waste, improve recycling and build our domestic recycling capacity in the future? The minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Van for, uh, for his question and, uh, and his strong interest in, uh, in particularly uh, recycling and practical environmental measures. And, uh, the benefits of building a strong economy and being in a strong budget position uh, is that governments are able to invest in, uh, in practical things such as environmental protection and a cleaner environment. Uh, and doing so helps not only to underpin a better and cleaner environment but also a strong economy. Uh, the Morrison government believes that practical solutions such as reducing waste, increasing recycling rates and growing our domestic waste and recycling industry can deliver both a cleaner environment and a stronger economy. Uh, indeed, evidence shows that uh, reducing waste is not only good for the environment, uh, but it's good for the economy with just over nine jobs created uh, for every 10,000 tonnes of waste recycled. Uh, that's why we are leading a substantial investment in recycling and implementing a comprehensive $167 million Australian recycling investment plan. This includes $100 million through the Australian Recycling Investment Fund, delivered through the Clean Energy Finance Corporation to support manufacturing of lower emissions and energy efficient recycled content products. $20 million through the Product Stewardship Investment Fund to accelerate work on industry-led recycling schemes like batteries, electronic products, voltaics, 
photo photovoltaic systems and plastic oil containers. $20 million through the Cooperative Research Centre's Projects Grant Program to find new and innovative solutions to plastic recycling and waste, and of course continuing to work with state and territory and local governments on opportunities to get re more recycled content, particularly into road construction. At the recent COAG uh, meeting, the Prime Minister secured agreement from state and territory leaders to establish a timetable to ban the export of waste and that is unnecessary in areas such as plastic, paper, glass and tyres, while building Australia's capacity uh, to generate high-value recycled commodities and, importantly, onshore demand for that recycled content. Senator Van, a supplementary question. I thank the minister for that uh, impressive answer. Can the minister update the Senate on actions the government is taking to stop plastic waste entering our rivers and oceans? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks. Thanks, thank, thanks, Mr. President. Indeed, to, to, to Channel Senator Smith, I thank Senator Van for uh, for his impressive question. Um, <laughs> Uh, or supplementary. Um, it's not just a domestic question in relation to uh, to addressing uh, the uh, the waste and, uh, and recycling question. It is also one where we, in our deep connection to our oceans, beaches, and waterways, are committed to working with our partners across uh, the Indian and Pacific Oceans. That's why we're supporting our Pacific neighbours uh, to combat uh, marine litter with the $16 million Pacific Ocean Litter Project. And why earlier this month at the Indian Ocean Rim Association Ministerial Conference on the Blue Economy. Uh, Minister Payne announced the establishment of the Iora Indian Ocean Blue Carbon Hub. The Perth-based scientific hub, uh, hosted by the Indian Ocean Marine Research Centre at the University of Western Australia, will allow experts from across the Indian Ocean Rim to protect the health of ocean carbon ecosystems such as mangroves, tidal marshes and seagrasses, providing more practical assistance uh, towards Order. a cleaner environment. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Is the minister aware of any alternative approaches? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, thanks, Mr. President. Our government has shown clear leadership in uh, in this regard, and Prime Minister Morrison demonstrating clear passion to reform Australia's recycling industry to deal with the issue of waste that is being exported, to make sure that we create better scientific and economic plans to be able to not just in Australia but across our region enhance the recycling capability of Australia and ensure we have cleaner beaches and oceans. Uh, of course, Mr President, in terms of other plans, we hear silence when it comes to these types of practical environmental initiatives. Uh, those, opposite, those opposite often have lofty rhetoric when it comes to the environment, but never deliver when it comes to practical policies, practical on-the-ground measures that can help households, businesses and, most importantly, set up economically viable, ongoing, resilient commercial industries to drive waste management and make sure we have greater recycling well into the future. Order. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr President. My question this afternoon is to the Minister for Youth, Sport, uh, Senator Colbeck. The Grattan Institute's Generation Gap, ensuring a fair go for younger Australians, report found that rising rates of underemployment for under 25s account for much of the growth in underemployment overall. Can the minister confirm that the share of employed young people who are actively seeking more work has grown from 12 per cent to 20 per cent over the past decade? The Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. That's Thank you, Mr. President. Um, well, yeah, thank you. Order. <laughs> Order. Yeah, that's exactly right. Order. Order on my left. Tis. Senator Colbert. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the, thing, the thing that the Australian government is concerned about is ensuring that Australians across the board have the opportunity to get a job, and that's why the focus of the Australian government has been on employment and 1.4 million jobs created for Australians over the last uh, 12 months, including over 100,000 of those for young people, Mr. President. 
So our focus has been on continuing to keep a strong economy, growing youth employment, uh, and, and ensuring that young people have the opportunity to get a good. Thank you. Sir. Thank Order. you, Mr. President. So, so our focus clearly, Mr. President, is, is continuing to ensure that young people have the opportunity to get a job. Uh, 100,000 jobs created in the last 12 months by the by this Australian economy, based on the premises and the structure that the Australian government has put into place. And, Mr. President, when I talk to young people Austra around Australia, that is the focus that they have. They want. Uh, only very Order. recently, Senator Polly. Only very recently. So our focus remains on doing the things that are important to young people here in Australia, keeping the Australian Order. economy Senator strong Colbeck. and ensuring Senator opportunities Pratt, for jobs growth. Senator a supplementary growth. question. Order. Can I suggest, with respect, we don't start the new habit of applause, except at the end of firsts or valedictory speeches? There's a time after question time to note answers. Applause is clearly out of order whether it's intended or otherwise. Senator Pratt, a Thank you, Mr President. Question. With a youth unemployment rate of 11.7%, 260,000 young Australians are unemployed. Can the minister confirm that youth unemployment is more than double the national average for unemployment? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, clearly the youth unemployment rate is higher than the national rate for uh, employment across the board. That's a, that's a statement of fact. So I will confirm the fact that you put on the table, uh, and that's why uh, that's that's why we have a number of programs in place specifically to target the employment of youth in the Australian economy. So the youth jobs path, which 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 I might add, Mr. 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 President, Labor opposed tooth and nail is about getting young people job ready. It's about giving them a go, and it's about getting them into a job, Mr. President. Which and, and, and noting that getting the opportunity to have a job and the program that the Labor Party opposed in this Parliament uh, is about assisting youth, working with youth to get a job. And, and actually being tactical Order. about doing things and not opposing things in the chamber. Order. Senator Pratt, a final supplementary question. Senator, currently, there are more than 670,000 young Australians unemployed or underemployed. Can the minister confirm that this represents more than 30 per cent of young people? Yep. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, and that's why we put the programs in place that we are to assist young people to get into a job. And, and, and well, Mr. President, the opposition interject that they're failing, and yet the facts don't demonstrate that. The facts don't demonstrate that. When there's 100,000 jobs for young people created in the last 12 months, that doesn't indicate that the programs that we're putting into place are failing. In fact. It indicates that we've been proactive about what we're doing as a government, Mr. President. It's about the fact that we're working with Australians, with the economy, to get people into jobs. And the fact that there are so many jobs being created for young people across the economy is an indication that the programs that we're putting in place are working, as opposed, Mr. President, as opposed by those opposite. They oppose the Jobs Path program we put in place Order. to assist people to get a foot in the door and to get employment. Order on my left. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Order. Can, can the Minister advise the Senate how the Morrison government has produced a strong economy and strong budget that, facilita that, that facilities initiative, facilitates initiatives and support for Australia's carers, especially those young carers at risk of long-term welfare dependence? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you, Order. thank you very much, Mr. President. And um, can I thank Senator Askew for her question, but particularly thank her, given that this week is actually National Carers Week, where Australians recognise that around 2.7 million Australians who care for somebody else who needs a little extra help. 
And I think it is timely for us to celebrate the contribution that these people make to the social fabric of our country. Can I also acknowledge today Ara Creswell, the CEO, and uh, Dr Peter Lungkamp, the president of Carers Australia, uh, and to particularly thank them for the extraordinary effort and time that they put in to the amazing support they gave us during the recent reform process. This new reform process now sees $700 million worth of support to go to Australia's unpaid carers. And this has gone through the new integrated carer support model. It's designed by carers, it's designed for carers, and the co-design process was actually led by Carers Australia. And this new model actually puts in place a very strong emphasis on early intervention. We want to ensure that carers get the help that they need before they reach crisis point. So in the 2000, uh, we want to make sure by 2021-22 that there will be five times the number of services available to our uncared carers, carers that are, are available today. And most importantly, we want to support our young carers, and we want to make sure that they are not at risk of long-term welfare dependency. One of the programs we've put in place is the Young Carers Bursary Program, which provides assistance of up to $3,000 for young carers. We've already put through more than 980 young people through this particular course, uh, and we intend to increase the numbers of doing that. But how do we do it? How do we do it? We do it because we have a strong economy, because we have a strong economy that allows us to fund the services that are so, so important to some of these very essential groups that support our community. On this side, we're delivering our promises. We're supporting Australians. Senator Askew, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Minister. The government's Carer Gateway is providing new digital counselling and other online services for the first time. Minister, what other options are also being provided to those carers who have limited IT skills and prefer to talk to someone and discuss their circumstances in person? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and thank you, Senator Raskew, for your follow-up question. Since July this year, um, we have put in place a new digital IT uh, platform for digital counselling and online uh, services uh, through a very important new carers' gateway. However, we do recognise that there still are a number of people out there that either can, can't or prefer not to um, access this kind of information through savvy IT services. Instead, they prefer to get their information in person. So, With carers, we want to continue to make sure that they can access face-to-face -face and phone support for services uh, through the existing carers program uh, under the new integrated carer support services. Now, this new gateway provides services in you know, carer support and planning, coaching, counselling, financial support and the like. But once again, Australians know that you can only provide these sorts of services if you have a strong economy, because a strong economy allows us to afford to put these things in place. Senator Askew, a final supplementary question. Minister, what is the Morrison government doing to support carers who need to access respite services? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Um, we absolutely understand that one of the fundamental services that people, our carers, are calling for is respite services. Um, we want to make sure that those respite services are available to people before they get to crisis point. So that's why in the 2019-20 budget we announced an additional $84.3 million over the next four years to boost availability for respite services and support particularly for our young carers. Under our reforms, we are going to continue to build the amount of funding that's available to this really critical group of people who provide services to our community. Um, and as I said, the most one of the most important services that the carers have advised us that they call uh, asking for is for respite services. So, in this week of National Carers Week, it is fantastic to acknowledge our national carers because, with the theme of why uh, we care, it's very appropriate to acknowledge their extraordinary Order. work. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Education, Minister Birmingham. Do you believe that our young people who don't want to go to uni and like learning with their hands, like me, have access to high-quality modern facilities and training equipment? The Minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Birmingham. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator Lambie uh, for her question and her interest in this area. Uh, the answer uh, 
uh, in general to her question is, is of course, yes, uh, the importance of choice for uh, Australian students, school leavers uh, and indeed others in terms of their educational opportunities uh, is an important one. Uh, it, uh, it is one that can ensure we have the uh, skills mix that we need for, our, need for our economy, and it's important that whether it be the higher education sector or the vocational education and training sector, uh, that they are responsive to the, uh, the employment opportunities of students, uh, what they will be able to, uh, to secure in terms of uh, jobs when they leave, and that they are training people accordingly for those jobs of the future. And certainly, in terms of our higher education reforms, performance funding for universities. Uh, we have sought to better gear funding and university yeah. behaviour uh, to ensure uh, that they um, uh, enrol students in courses that uh, have the greatest potential for employment success. And in terms of our agreements that we have with states and territories around vocational education and training funding, which we provide direct to the states and territories for the administration and support of vocational education and training systems. Again, uh, Minister Cash. Uh, now in, uh, in the skills and vocational education area uh, works to make sure uh, that states and territories are more responsive in the utilisation of that funding so that students enrolled in those vocational education courses, be it apprenticeships or other areas of vocational training, are actually enrolled in courses uh, that have the greatest job prospects for the future. That every uh, dollar of Commonwealth funding uh, that flows, uh, such as the $162.8 million provided to Tasmania over five years through the National Skills and Workforce Development Agreement, uh, is targeted to support uh, skills development in the areas that have the greatest economic need and greatest employment prospects for those young Australians. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Um, that's great, Minister. It seems like you and I are on the same page. So I find it very interesting because I recently visited a few TAFEs. And would you be surprised to learn and do you think it's appropriate that the students in our TAFEs are in some cases learning their trades on equipment that was manufactured during the Cold War? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Mr. President. And uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, Mr. President, um, uh, a few points in relation to, uh, to Senator Lambie's uh, uh, comment and, uh, and assertion there. Uh, in some instances, I mean, in some instances, some um, um, equipment may well last a long period of time, but where necessary, <coughs> modern equipment should be available for modern skills and training uh, needs. Uh, TAFEs are not run uh, by the Australian government; they are run by the states and territories. Uh, that's why, as a federal government, uh, uh, we provide significant funding to the states and territories. Uh, in addition to the $3 billion we spend annually, we're investing some $585 billion in uh, significant reforms in the vocational education and training sector. Uh, and whilst not directly funding TAFEs, that money is there for utilisation by states and territories to ensure that students have access to courses they need and that those TAFEs or other training providers are delivering modern courses befitting Order. the training Senator that people Birmingham. need for the future. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, given that our young people are being trained on Soviet-era technology, does the government have any plans to provide top-ups to the TAFEs for infrastructure and equipment, and if so, how much do you intend to commit across the nation? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, as, as an aside, I'm always disappointed for a reference to anything in the Soviet era that's made in this chamber when Senator Kim Carr is not present. Um, it's a missed opportunity. How, however, in, uh, in seriousness, because it's a serious question that, uh, that Senator Lambie, uh, Lambie asks, um, uh, uh, no, the federal government is, uh, is, is not uh, in the business of uh, funding directly. Uh, to, uh, to those institutions. Our business is, uh, is in funding the states and territories who own the TAFEs, uh, who operate the TAFEs and who set the policies around enrolment in the TAFEs and making sure that uh, those states and territories are held to account for investing in the skills needs that Australians uh, want to pursue. And I know that Senator Cash, in negotiating with the states and territories, has a laser-like focus on ensuring uh, that they are looking at spending every single dollar on the things that will give training with optimal employment outcomes for young Australians, whether that's investing in the equipment, investing in the types of subsidies Order, that Senator are delivered Birmingham. to those students, the making sure they expired. get the skills. Senator Mariel Smith. My question is to the Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colwick. While youth employment is at 11.7 per cent, more than double the national average, the government's flagship youth employment program, PATH, is failing. 
Having set itself the target of 30,000 internship placements per year, can the minister confirm that only 8,234 young people have commenced internships between April 2017 and January 2019? The Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, thank you Mr President. Um, you were going to abolish that. Order. As I, as Order on both sides of the chamber so that the minister may ask. Aunt, Sen Senator, all senators, can you show some respect to Senator Smith, who has asked the question so that she may receive an answer? Senator Watt. Senator Watt. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I can confirm that that's the number of uh, placements that have been made under the program, Mr. President. Um, uh, but it's also worth noting that. It's, it's, it's better than what would have been under the circumstance that the Labor Party voted for in this chamber, which was not, not to have the program at all. So over 8,000 people do have the opportunity to start a job based on this program. Uh, and we've also a number of other programs that we've put in place, and I know a very popular program in, program in Tasmania, which is to uh, provide subsidy for the first and second year of apprentices. Uh, there's been a, a huge uptake, in fact, a very, very fast uptake in Tasmania. So we're continuing to work to grow. Uh, the, uh, the number of people in employment. In fact, the uh, number of people in youth uh, employment youth has increased by 23,200 or 1.2% to a record high of 1.963 million uh, uh, to the, over the year to the aug August 2019. So we continue, as I said before, to continue to grow youth employment. Uh, Full-time youth employment has risen by 17,900 a 2.1 per cent increase, uh, and youth part-time employment has increased by 5,400 or 0.5 per cent. And it is worth noting that even though the unemployment rate is at 11.7 per cent right now, it is 1 per cent lower than it was when, when Labor left government. 1 per cent lower than it was when Labor left government. So we continue to work. We continue to work to get people into jobs. We continue to work to get all Australians into jobs. Jobs, and that's why we implement programs that support youth into employment, uh, even though the Labor Party might oppose them, Mr. President. Uh, and they give young people the opportunity to get a start, things that the Labor Party oppose. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Reports have indicated that only 30 per cent of PATH participants have been offered a job at the end of their internship. Are these figures correct? If not, what percentage of PATH participants have been offered a job at the end of their internship? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, I'm not too sure why the Labor Party are complaining that 30 per cent of 8,000 young people have got a job. I mean, I'm not sure why they're complaining about this. We've, a program that the Labor Party didn't support is actually, in their own words, getting young people into employment. I'm not sure why the Labor Party would complain about that. Had the Labor Party had their way, this program wouldn't exist, and nobody would have got a job. Nobody would have got a job. And as I said, the unemployment when the Labor Party left office was 12.7 per cent. It's now 11.7 per cent. Is it low enough? No, it's not. We continue to work on that. But, Mr. President, when the Labor Party opposed programs that are about practically providing opportunities for young people to get into work, I won't be lectured. We won't be lectured by the Labor Party. Uh, when we're actually trying to do things that will provide opportunities for young people to get a job. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. The government has overseen the highest level of youth unemployment and underemployment in 40 years, the lowest number of new apprenticeships and traineeships in 20 years, and the failure of its exploitative path program. Isn't it clear that after six years of coalition government, young Australians are going to work harder but go backwards? Senator Colbeck. Mr. Mr. President, I have to reject, completely reject the premise of the question. Order. Given that the unemployment rate was 12.7 when that they were in, 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 in government and 11.7 per cent now, the unemployment rate is clearly lower than it was when the Labor Party were in government. So I reject the, that point, part of the question. The level of youth employment has, has increased by 1.2 per cent to a record high of $1.963 million over the year to August 2019. We continue to grow employment at all levels, including youth employment. We continue to grow employment, and we continue to put in place programs to assist young people to get into work. 
uh, and we won't be lectured by the Labor Party, who have opposed programs to provide opportunities for young people to get into work. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I note this is not my first speech. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Today is International Day of Rural Women. Can the minister outline the government's initiatives to recognise the contribution of rural women to Australia and to empower their aspirations? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And before I start uh, the answer to the final question uh, in today's question time, can I please acknowledge the members of the ADF parliamentary program here, who here. join us in the gallery today? Acknowledge them and thank them very much for their service and their contribution. Uh, thank you, Senator Henderson, for that uh, question. Because this morning I had the opportunity to join the National Rural Women's Coalition for their annual Rural, Regional, and Remote Women's Muster here in Canberra. A very opportune time to acknowledge the crucial role of rural women in Australia communities on this International Day of Rural Women. In the 2019 muster, there are 12 indomitable women. They cover the, literally the length and breadth of this country, I think, from Richmond in Tasmania and Mantung in South Australia, from Geraldton and Margaret River in WA, from Yulara in the Northern Territory, and even from Nor Norfolk Island. They bring diversity to their engagement with us in Canberra, uh, and they're bringing forward the views and the voices of rural women. We had a great conversation, Mr President. It was particularly moving in parts, including about the challenges of drought for them and for their families, on mental health, on isolation and a range of other factors. I want to also especially acknowledge today, Mr President, the representatives of rural women's organisations who have been joining me uh, at women's stakeholder roundtables in New South Wales, in Queensland and Tasmania in recent months, because they bring a distinct perspective to women's safety, economic empowerment and uh, leadership issues. We are very committed to supporting rural and women and girls in succeeding. Our Women's Economic Security Statement, which is backed by $151 million in funding over the four years, includes a number of measures that support rural, regional and remote women's and women and girls. And I particularly love the Future Female Entrepreneurs Program which will engage around 55,000 girls in around 50 face-to-face -face workshops, as well as young women nationwide, via a digital platform. And it's a digital platform that so helps to enable girls in rural, regional and remote areas to also ta engage in the program and tap into the 100 pieces of original content, videos and articles. Order. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate of the government's initiative for rural, regional and remote women under the Women's Economic Security Statement and Women's Leadership and Development Program? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I can. And I also want to acknowledge Senator Henderson's leadership as a woman from regional Australia who has uh, joined us here in the Senate following the uh, experience of the House of Representatives come to the other place uh, and note her great leadership in her own community, particularly around uh, Geelong. The Women's Economic Security Statement Mr. President, includes measures that support rural, regional and remote women's workforce participation. They are measures like Career Revive, an initiative that gives tailored business improvement assistance for regional employers to recruit and retain women who are seeking to return to work after a career break. And the first intake of those 10 businesses was selected in just in August this year. Through the Women's Leadership and Development Program, we are funding small-scale and one-off grants to specifically support regional, rural and remote women. There are two great examples I want to mention today. The Kalgoorlie Boulder Women's Leadership Forum, an annual one-day women's leadership forum in Kalgoorlie, where high-profile speakers discuss women's leadership, and most recently our commitment to Catholic Order. Care Will Canny of Forms. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate of what support the government provides for rural women experiencing family and domestic violence? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. And this is one of the most challenging areas for, for government, but most importantly for the families and communities that experience violence uh, in relation to women and their children particularly. We are proud to have made the single largest Commonwealth investment of $340 million to support the fourth action plan of the National Plan to Reduce Violence Against Women and Their Children 2010-2022. And the plan has a deliberate focus on responding to diverse perspectives, including rural women, through National Priority 3 in particular, respect, listen and respond to the diverse lived experience and knowledge of women and their children affected by violence. 
Through the fourth action plan, we've also invested $64 million in 1800 Respect, and it's nationally available to women across Australia through telephone counselling and online support. And that includes projects to improve accessibility for people from vulnerable and diverse cohorts, including, of course, coverage of rural, regional, and remote locations. There is more to do, Mr. Order, President, Senator but these Payne. are important steps. Senator Cormann. I ask that further questions be placed Thank on the notice paper. Senators, could I make a brief statement about a matter I committed to take away during question time yesterday? Yesterday, I committed to look at the hands out of question time and consider points of order raised regarding the direct relevance of an answer given by Senator Payne. Upon reviewing the hands out, I am happy with the ruling that I provided at the time, that the minister was directly relevant to the question, which included a quotation from a speech made by the Prime Minister by including other material from that speech in her answer. In deliberating on this, I consider it important that the matters the minister referred to in her answer were not simply any material in the quoted speech, but were directly related to the subject matter quoted in the question, in this case foreign affairs and policy, and not an unrelated policy area that just happened to be in the same speech. Senator Keneally. Oh. Senator Keneally. Mr. President, Mr. President, under Standing Order 74.5a, I seek an explanation from the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Immigration and Citizenship, Senator Cash, as to why questions numbered 382 and number 689, which I placed on notice 12 August and 13 September respectively, remain unanswered. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. Uh Madam Deputy President, and thank you, uh, Senator Keneally, um, and thank you for notice. I received it at 2:04 p.m. Unfortunately, so I have not had an opportunity yet to raise this with the minister. Uh, I will undertake to do so and revert to the chamber. But I would also note that uh, my understanding is you have placed a substantial number of questions uh, on the notice paper, which have been responded to. Uh, however, I will raise this with the minister and revert. Thank you, Minister. Senator Keneally. Uh, Madam Deputy President, uh, under Standing Order 74.5b, I move that the Senate take note of the explanation. Thank you. Yep. Yes, you can speak to that. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, well, to the people of uh, the chamber here today and in the gallery, I don't know if you have children. I do. And when my kids were little, they used to say to me, why do we have to learn about math? Why is math so important? When am I ever going to use this math in my daily life when I grow up? And let me just say, you know, sometimes as a parent, you do struggle to find the practical application for maths in daily life. You can talk about bank accounts and home loans, but that's a bit of an abstract notion. Today I sit here and I wonder, did the government members learn about maths when they were growing up, and do they see the application of maths in the jobs that they do today? For example, can they count to 30? Because that is the number of days that ministers get when you lodge a question on notice, you, they get 30 days to answer it. That is simple counting. And they simply have missed that deadline. The minister, in her explanation, noted that I have, quote, placed a substantial number of questions on notice. Hey, by the way, that is my right as a senator. Uh, she also notices many of them have been answered. Well, in fact, I could have put more questions uh, here today that have not been answered. I chose these two, uh, but there are a number that have not yet been answered. But let me continue why maths are important. Uh, because we saw this government, this government just this week, when it came to the issue of questions on notice, again show their lack of ability to deal with maths. I had a question to the government regarding the number of airplane arrivals uh, between uh, 31 July and uh, 19 August, and they gave me the incorrect number. They gave me the incorrect number. They gave me the number for another set of dates. So not only uh, has this government lost control of the borders at our airports, they have lost control of the ability to do the basic maths to count the number of people who are coming through our airports and claiming asylum. So uh, what we do know, though, even though they couldn't count for the specified period they couldn't count accurately for the specified period that was in my question on notice. One number does remain valid in their answer, and that is that Australia 
is now seeing under this third term Liberal government a record 95,000 people who have arrived at our nation's airports and claimed asylum. Australia has seen 95,000 people under this third term Liberal government arrive at our airports and claim asylum. That is at least one number they got right. Well, we assume they got it right until maybe they'll come back and change that too. I don't know. Uh, but of course, this government does have a track record. I mean, I do like to. I do have a bit of a memory. I remember the omnibus savings bill in 2016. I don't know if the, uh, the Minister for Finance remembers that bill. Uh, the government introduced that bill in 2016. They had a maths problem in that bill. This was their big omnibus savings bill. There it was on page five of that bill, a $107 million error. You know what the then treasurer, Scott Morrison, He's got another job now, by the way. He's the Prime Minister. He was the Treasurer then. He called it, and I quote, a computational error. Wow. A computational error. Making him possibly the first Treasurer in the history of Australia to admit that maths is not his strong suit. Anyway, uh, that computational error. Of course, we do know that when it comes to managing the budget, this government does have a particular problem uh, managing numbers, uh, because when uh, they left when we left office in September 2013, net debt was at $175 billion. Net debt today, under this third-term Liberal government, is $399.1 billion. I'll leave the government to see if they can do the math to work out how much they've increased at net debt. Gross debt, gross debt uh, September 13 was $280 billion. $280 billion. Hazard a guess as to what it is now? If you don't, don't worry. I can tell you it's $565 billion. Again, there's a math problem for the government. How much have they increased gross debt under this third-term Liberal government? Now, we come to the questions that I have asked, and you know some of them are maths-based, so perhaps they had trouble doing the maths. I asked, uh, in question 698, I asked, how many people made onshore protection claims in the 2018-19 financial year? And then I asked in the 2018-19 financial year how many people made onshore protection claims in the following jurisdictions: New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria, South Australia, Western Australia, Tasmania, the Australian Capital Territory, and the Northern Territory. And then I went on and asked a number of other questions. You know, can a breakdown be provided by citizenship of country for the top 10 countries only? I would have thought this is information, uh, numbers uh, that the Department of Home Affairs would have to hand and the government could have then provided to this Senate. Uh, I also note that I asked a number of other questions in question 382. Uh, for example, when in 2016, 2016 by the way, that's the year they had the omnibus savings bill that had the $107 million computational error in it, but I digress. In 2016, when in 2016 did the minister first become aware of the current surge in asylum seeker applications from citizens of Malaysia, and when did the minister first become aware of the current surge of, application of asylum seeker applications from citizens from China? And what actions did the minister take when he became aware of these surges, and what were these actions taken? Uh, and then I went on and I asked a few other questions, and I, I asked another um, maths question again, so perhaps maths really isn't the strong suit of this government. Of the people who've arrived by plane and then applied for asylum since 2014, what are the current numbers for each of the top five citizenships? You know, at the primary stage, at the, at H, the AAT, at judicial review, et cetera, et cetera. It was a range of questions that go to the heart of what this government says is their core strength securing our nation's borders. They have no problem telling you the number of boats that arrived. Uh, they have no problem telling you the number of boat uh, applications, uh, asylum seeker applications for people who came by boat in the previous five years before they took office. What they have a huge problem in doing is being able to be straight with the Australian people that when it comes to asylum seeker applications for people who arrive by airplane, we are on track to double the number of people who lodged an asylum claim and came by boat. We are closing in on 100,000 applications, onshore asylum seeker applications from this government who trumpets that securing the borders is their top priority and their core expertise. Well, let's remember, let's remember 
that we have borders, yes, because we're an island, we have water borders, but we also have airplane, we have airport borders. And this government, this government created the Department of Home Affairs. They created it. When they did that, they brought in Australian Border Force. They brought in uh, the Australian Federal Police. They brought in ASIO and ACES and all of those agencies under this, um, this mega department of the Department of Home Affairs because they and they alone, they claimed, knew how to secure the borders and keep Australians safe. This is what the then Prime Minister, you may remember him, his name is Malcolm Turnbull, said in July 2017, and I quote, when it comes to our nation's security, we must stay ahead of the threats against us. There is no room for complacency. There is no room for set and forget. The current Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, has used the same phrase when describing everything from Australia's foreign policy through to the emergency response for the drought. There is no set and forget, says the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison. And yet, while there was so much fanfare around the creation of the Department of Home Affairs portfolio, it would seem that set and forget has been the key strategy for both the Prime Minister and the Minister for Home Affairs when it comes to this critical portfolio. After all, after all, how else can you possibly explain that there are more than 200,000 people on bridging visas right now in Australia? That is a massive increase in the number of bridging visas. I might put that as a question on notice and see if that's another math problem the government can solve. What has been the increase, the blowout in bridging visas? More than 221,000 would-be citizens, permanent residents, are waiting an average of 13 months to have their citizenship pro applications processed. Let's just reflect that when they took over, when we left office, it took about five months to get a citizenship application uh, processed. So uh, here's a math problem. It now takes 13 months. It used to take five. How many more months has it blown out? Eight. Thank you very much, Senator. All right, now, they've also spent more than $423 million paid to Paladin, a company first based out of a beach shack in Kangaroo Island that went, later went on to be fined some 3000 700 times in a 12-month period for failing to meet minimum service standards. How did Paladin get this contract? Well, we really don't know because there was no competitive tender. There was no maths, obviously, involved. The government simply just threw a whole lot of money at this company uh, that was registered to a beach shack and said, go ahead, uh, $20 million a month. By the way, Paladin so bad at doing their job uh, at providing, they were supposed to be providing security to Manus Island, what they, they were apparently not very good at it because we know from other information provided to the Senate that the Department of Home Affairs officials were too scared to visit Manus Island because they felt it was not secure. So there you go, $20 million a month of Australians' money uh, and not, not getting the job done. Now, there's possibly no greater example, though, of set and forget than the Minister for Home Affairs' approach to border security. I mean, you only have to look at the government's late talking points this week to know that uh, the minister is uh, quite a little bit obsessed uh, when it comes to talking about labor. Uh, after all, it was a labor prime minister, Kevin Rudd, uh, who, in fact, uh, did the heavy lifting to get the boat stopped. Scott Morrison, who's given himself a little where, where Scott Morrison's given himself that little trophy about I stopped the boats. You, we've all seen the photo of that in his office. Peter's, he picked up and ran with, Rudd's port, um, with what Kevin Rudd had been putting in place. Peter Dutton swans into the portfolio and assumed the, he assumed that, and he assumed that the risks to Australia's border security would remain static. But while the, while the Home Affairs Minister has been so keen to talk about boats, he has missed the fact that the people smugglers have changed their business model from boats to planes. He has utterly missed the fact that the people smugglers have changed their business model from boats to planes. And that is why we are seeing, we are seeing this massive blowout in the number of people who are coming to Australia seeking asylum coming through our nation's airports. Now I want to put on record, there is nothing wrong with seeking asylum. It is an important legal right. But that is not what is happening here. What is happening here is that people smugglers are trafficking workers, largely from China and Malaysia, on electronic tourist and other valid visas, 
They are bringing people into Australia. They are getting them to apply for asylum while they are here. They know that because this department has had a blowout in processing all types of applications, asylum, citizenship, parent visas, child visas, all of those time frames have blown out. So what happens? These people are put on bridging visas, they are given work rights, and then they are sent out to work in low-paid, exploitative conditions. They are sent out to work in horticulture, in hospitality, and in a range of other industries to work in these low-paid, exploitative conditions, conditions that I can only describe as akin to slavery. I have met some of these workers. They tell stories of being paid just a couple of dollars an hour. They tell stories of having their belongings taken away from them while they're out the day, during the day at work, and then they're forced to buy them back from the labor hire company. They tell stories of how the labor hire company takes their passport and their papers and holds them essentially hostage. Now, I just want to make a couple of observations here. One, the growers in our horticulture industry are not to blame for this. They are, in fact, sick of this going on. They are being held hostage by these labor hire companies as well and by this government's failure to provide an appropriate uh, visa system that actually provides the reliable, steady stream of workers that they need. That is why you see the uh, horticulture system out last year arguing for an agriculture visa. That is why you see them in the building here today trying to meet with MPs to talk about the fact that they do not have access to a steady supply of workers. We have, I've met with one grower who offered to hire the workers who were coming onto his farm. He offered to hire them directly and pay them appropriately because he was already paying the appropriate wage to labor hire company. It just wasn't being passed on to the workers. He offered to do that, and the next day half of the workers didn't turn up because they couldn't. They were essentially being held hostage by the labor hire company who had their passport and their papers. That is the exploitation of workers the trafficking of workers in this country, into this country, and the exploitation of them that is taking place under this government that has failed to notice that people smugglers are using the asylum seeker system and the blowout in processing times to traffic people here to work in exploited conditions. And the questions that I asked on notice were designed to get a better understanding of the scale of the problem, to define it, to help us help define a policy solution. And I don't mean us, just the Labour Party. I mean us, this Senate. I mean us, Australia. I have held two roundtables, uh, one here in Canberra and one in Shepparton in Victoria, where I have sat down and spoken with local councils, with unions, with the growers, with the growers' associations. I have been to farms. I have talked to people, who, who workers, who have been exploited. I have tried to help define this problem so that then we can try to define some solutions. That, though, is not what the government seems to be interested in. They know, and they cite themselves a figure, that some 85 per cent of the people who apply for asylum when they come through our airports are found not to be refugees. This is clearly what is happening, that people are being trafficked here. And by the way, I say to the members of the government, and I say to the people who are here today listening and across Australia who are, who are listening to this debate, don't just take my word for it. Assistant Minister Jason Wood, in this government, was previously the chair of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Migration. And what did he say in a Parliamentary Joint Committee um, on migration report last year that organized uh, that criminal syndicates and illegitimate labor hire companies are exploiting a loophole in our immigration system to traffic workers into the country that is the word those are the words of the assistant minister in this liberal national third term government if he can see it why can't the government see it and don't just take my word for it take the word of the member from Mali and Dr. Ann Webster, who described what is going on in horticulture as, and I quote, a crisis. She has described it as a crisis. She has called on her own prime minister to take action on this, yet the government sits silent. Not only do they sit silent, they stand condemned of being able to even do the basic maths to count appropriately the number of people who are coming to our airports and claiming asylum 
They lack the capacity to comply with the standing orders of this Senate to supply questions to ans supply answers to questions on notice within the required 30 days. If they were so serious about border security, they would have these answers at their fingertips, and they would be able to supply them to the Senate. Mm -hmm. Let me also make this point. Let me also make this point that when people are trafficked into the country, it is an exploitation of those people, and we should be morally outraged, and we should condemn it. I don't think the mums and dads of Australia would like to know that the fruit that they are putting in their children's lunchbox has been picked by some 19-year-old woman who's been trafficked here, who is being paid $4 an hour, and being is subject to physical and sexual abuse. I really don't think that that is the Australian fair go, the Australian way of life, or something that the mums and dads of Australia would appreciate. But let me also make the observation that when we build an economy based on a temporary exploited migrant workforce, that lowers the wages and conditions available across the economy. When we have workers, whether it's in hospitality or horticulture or in beauty or in transport or in any other industry, working for as little as $4 an hour, that makes it really hard for other businesses to compete on price. It lowers the wages and conditions. Perhaps not surprising coming from a government that said low wages were a design feature of their economic plan. But this is the design feature they have for Australia. They are building an economy based on a low-paid, migrant, temporary, exploited workforce. So the fact that they cannot stand here today in the Senate after 30 days and answer basic questions about the basic numbers of the number of people who are coming through our airports and claiming asylum, that they have no capacity or recognition that this is a problem, when they have their own ministers and members calling out for them to take action, when they have the horticulture industry in the building today trying to get solutions in front of government. Well, they should stand condemned, and they do. And I look forward, and I hope that when the minister finally answers my questions, he gets his maths right, and he gets his answers right, but more importantly, I hope they get action on this problem and we get a solution. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you. I also rise to take note on Minister Cash's explanation of unanswered questions on notice. Or should I say, take note of a non-explanation regarding unanswered questions on notice. Now, I'm relatively new to this place, but it doesn't really seem like an unreasonable request to me that these questions get answered within 30 days. These are pretty basic questions, and as Senator Keneally has said, they're questions of basic mathematics. So why isn't the government answering our questions? And what is it that they're trying to hide? Not answering questions put to the government through correct channels in this place says more about their answers than their leaked talking points do. Maybe the government is trying to hide the fact that this financial year an average of 65 people per day have made a claim for asylum under the Liberals. Or maybe they're trying to hide the fact that a staggering 4,000 airplane people have made a claim for protection between 1 July 2019 and 31 August 2019. That's 4,000 people in just 62 days under this government. Now, the government's own leaked talking points on this issue states the government is focusing resources both on and offshore, and offshore to prevent unmeritorious protection claims. But they say they have stopped the boats. So what offshore prevention are they focusing on? And are they focusing on it at all? From 1 July 2014 to 31 August 2019, 95,000 protection visa applications were lodged by persons who entered Australia lawfully by air. 95,000. Well, some of our regional towns don't have that population, and it's a population that could almost fill the MCG. Or more relevantly, the people in my state could fill two Adelaide ovals. And yet, the government's leaked talking points again state the numbers of those who apply for protection are declining. In 2018-19, the number of onshore protection claims fell by 12 per cent, a result of the government's focus on stopping unmeritorious claims. 95,000 are a result of the government's focus. I think it's time for the government to visit the optometrist because their focus is completely out of whack. But more than that, the government claims that between 2018 and 2019, the number of onshore protection claims fell by 12 per cent. But when you look back at the breakdown of figures per year since 2014, what you can actually see is that under this government, the figures rose substantially every year, and there was merely a very small decrease between 2018 and 2019. 
The breakdown shows that between 2014 and 15 it was over 8,000 persons. The next year the number jumped to over 12,000. The year after that it hit 18,000 and in 2017-2018 the figures soared to a staggering 27,000 people who made a claim for protection. Now, it must be said that the majority of these people applying for asylum are not genuine refugees. We are not talking about vulnerable stateless people who need our protection. We are talking about people exploiting a loophole in this government's so-called tough border protection to seek asylum in Australia illegally. The government can try and blur the figures all they like. They can skew the figures to their benefit as much as they like, but they cannot hide from the fact that under this government the exploitation of Australia's visa and migration system is absolutely out of control. And the government knows this. The now Assistant Minister for Customs, Community Safety and Multicultural Affairs, Jason Wood MP, flagged the exploitation of Australia's visa and migration system earlier this year. In the last parliament, Mr Wood was the chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Migration. And the committee handed down its report of the inquiry into the efficacy of current regulation of Australian migration and education agents. Wood makes the, made the comments as chair in the foreword. Organised crime and illegitimate labour hire companies are using this loophole to bring out illegal workers who are often vulnerable and open to exploitation. This represents an orchestrated scam that enables these criminal elements to exploit foreign workers in Australia until their claims are finalised. So the government can pretend they don't know where their focus is. They can pretend the figures don't exist, or at least the ones they don't like. But this government cannot hide from the fact that they knew about this issue and they knew the extent of this issue. They have lost control of our borders. Of the protection visa applications decided by the department between 1 July 2014 and 19 August 2019, over 60,000 people, or 84 per cent, to be exact, were refused. Now, the government likes to stand up in this place and dismiss genuine refugees who come to our country to seek protection for their families and hope for a better life. But they are more than happy to allow tens of thousands of people who are not genuine refugees to exploit our immigration system via the air. Worst of all is that the government knows all of this and they are just not telling us because they know the Australian people would not accept a government that has absolutely lost control of its borders and put our national security at risk. Both the Minister for Home Affairs, Mr Peter Dutton, and the Immigration Minister, David Coleman, have confirmed this. Peter Dutton has said between 14, 15 and 17, 18, 64,362 people arrived by air and subsequently applied for protection. Over the same period, 7,600 were granted a protection visa, which is a refusal rate of 90 per cent. And David Coleman has said people who arrive lawfully by plane, we obviously know who they are. They have a lawful visa, and in terms of the people who actually apply for protection when they get here, more than 90 per cent are rejected in the number of people who are applying. So far this year is down by about 20 per cent. So it's coming down to the number of people who are applying onshore for protection. So for the Labor Party to raise issues related to protection visas is ridiculous. Their legacy in unlawful boat arrivals, where our border force officers were required to go out onto the high seas to place themselves at risk, and of course, the families themselves placing themselves at risk, that was an appalling situation. It was a humanitarian catastrophe, and there is absolutely no comparison to other forms of applications for protection. That's what David Coleman said. Senator Smith, may I remind you to refer to those in the other place by their correct title? Thank yes. you. Apologies. There is a greater issue at play here with airplane people claiming asylum, and it is an issue of exploitation. Once these individuals make a claim for protection and their original visa expires, they are then placed on a bridging visa, often with work rights. Now, there are currently over 200,000 people on bridging visas in Australia. The number of people in brid on bridging visas in Australia reached record high levels of 230,000 in March this year under this Liberal government. Bridging visas have blown out quarter on quarter year on year since Peter Dutton became the responsible minister in December 2014. That is six straight years of significant increases. From 30 June 2018 to 30 June, sorry, the number of people on bridging visas in Australia increased by 29,000 people. Since the Liberals formed government in September 2013, the number of people on bridging visas in Australia has increased by 93,000. In fact, this increase alone is more than double the number of boat arrivals under the previous Labor government. So this government, who is constantly telling Australia that they are strong on our borders, strong on the protection of our national security, are in fact not actually telling us the full picture. The government attempts to claim the majority of people on bridging visas are part of the legacy caseload of boat arrivals. 
The Home Affairs Minister has been quoted to say that people who arrived under the Labor Party by boat are a large number of the times we don't know who they are because of issues in terms of identity. They don't have travel documents and there are still many thousands of those people who are on bridging visas in the community as a direct consequence of the 50,000 people who arrived under Labor. We've got that number down over the years, but it's been a long process and continues to be and is a direct consequence of Labor's legacy. However, according to the July 2019 Illegal Maritime Arrivals Legacy Case Load Report, there are only 8,000 people with applications on hand or at review. Visa processing times are both a reason for and a symptom of the current problem. In addition to all of this, the government has allowed these people to become vulnerable and face widespread exploitation in Australia. It's contributing to a growing labour crisis in the agricultural and horticultural sector, as Senator Keneally has said, and is significantly impacting my home state of South Australia. Virginia in South Australia is a regional town close to Adelaide, with most growers requiring labour all year round to work on a variety of vegetable crops, such as carrots, potatoes and tomatoes, although there are of course inflated labour needs as well at harvest time. Now, a study conducted by Howe et al at the University of Adelaide titled Towards a Durable Future, Tackling Labour Challenges in the Australian Horticulture Industry showed some staggering evidence of the government's policy failure in this area. Now, despite being an eligible postcode for the Working Holiday Maker Visa extension, growers interviewed by Howell et al relied heavily on a local population of recently arrived permanent migrants from developing countries. The study found that the absence of an intermediary role by accommodation providers can be attributed to the permanent residency status of the workforce, with no need for temporary accommodation. Now, the case study in Virginia also revealed much less reliance on intermediaries than in the other four case studies conducted by Howell et al in Virginia, the ABC Four Corners television program investigating exposing non-compliant labour hire use there in 2015 has had a unique impact on growers' decision making regarding labour hire use. Now, there was a general consensus among large and medium-sized growers in Virginia that using labour hire posed significant risks to their businesses. As one grower reported, after that, referring to the Four Corners program, we moved to direct employment and hired a human resources manager. There was a high level of distrust of labour hire among growers in Virginia. The response of some growers was to bring all hiring decisions in-house. One grower reported, we got stung really badly by a dodgy labour hire company that was ripping off the workers and paying them the permanent rate but treating them like a casual. So when we audited payslips, we thought they were getting paid right. Another grower told the study, I think labour hire is too dangerous and often attracts the wrong kind of people. We don't want to work with contractors much because it's our responsibility to check everybody. Labour hire should be audited or closed up as an industry, otherwise it is too risky. The exploitation of workers, regardless of their status, in our country and under this government's watch is utterly and absolutely unacceptable. It is a perfect example of the growing list of policy failures from this Liberal government. Now, if this government can't even be trusted to hold on to their own speaking notes, how can they be trusted to manage illegal plane arrivals entering into Australia? It is absolutely clear that on the issue of national security and border protection, this chaotic and shambolic government cannot be trusted. And it seems pretty clear to me that this is precisely the reason why they have failed to answer Labor's questions. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Watt. Thank you, <coughs> Madam Deputy President. Uh, as Senator Keneally and Senator Smith have already outlined, uh, the reason the opposition has put this item up for debate today is the need to again highlight the gross maladministration uh, of this government, particularly in relation to the home affairs portfolio. Um, this is something that we have pursued for some time now. I remember in the previous term uh, of this parliament, I was involved as a member of estimates committees which explored Minister Dutton's maladministration of his portfolio, uh, included, including such uh, celebrated examples as the Paladin affair, where we saw hundreds of millions of dollars handed out to a company based in a beach shack at Kangaroo Island um, with limited oversight by Minister Dutton's department, with limited tendering processes, uh, raising uh, serious questions about where taxpayer dollars had been spent and what processes had been used to ensure that taxpayers received value for money. 
Uh, and here we are again in a new, in a new term of uh, government, a new term of this parliament, with Minister, Minister Dutton again uh, being responsible for gross maladministration in his portfolio. It begins with his continued failure to answer appropriate detailed questions on notice posed by Senator Keneally about serious matters in his portfolio. So it begins with the failure to respect the parliament by providing timely answers to questions on notice, but it goes to the broader issues of maladministration, which is the subject of these questions on notice. Now, in the time available, I'm only going to deal with one example of that maladministration, which we are seeking information of through these questions on notice, and that concerns the incredible blowout in numbers of people that we are seeing uh, come to this, uh, come to our country via plane uh, outside the usual processes. Now we know that the government has made a lot of mileage, political mileage, over recent years uh, around people coming to Australia by boat. Uh, but in the meantime, we've been seeing a much bigger problem arise under this government's very nose in the form of in the form of people coming to Australia by plane. Now. Uh, some of you are aware that I have a very long history, uh, both in this parliament and as a lawyer, in defending the rights of asylum seekers and refugees. And I join with Senator Keneally in putting on the record that, unlike some members of this government, Labor understands that it is not illegal to seek asylum, and I make no condemnation of the people uh, who do that. But what I do make condemnation of uh, are the organised crime syndicates who are you can often find behind the number of people who are coming to Australia by plane uh, without proper processes, without and uh, and then staying on in Australia for a number of years, and uh, the 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 purpose of these organised crime syndicates is to exacerbate a problem that we have seen grow on this government's watch, and that is the gross exploitation of migrant workers from many parts of this world. Uh, this has arisen uh, in the previous term of parliament, and it has been going on for a long time, where, unfortunately, we do see some unscrupulous operators, particularly in horticulture and other uh, industry sectors, who take advantage of migrant workers. And in fact, Madam President, I know this is something that you've worked on personally, both in this parliament and prior to your arrival in this parliament. Um, and we are seeing, unfortunately, a growing number of people being brought into this country by organised crime syndicates for the express purpose of exploiting them, of putting them uh, onto farms and into other workplaces and paying them extremely low rates of money. Four dollars an hour was the sort of figures that Senator Keneally was talking about, and also uh, forcing people to endure uh, quite horrific conditions. Um, I'll just give you one, a couple of examples from my own home state of Queensland that we've seen, uh, where fair work inspectors investigated the alleged underpayment of 22 workers from Vanuatu employed to pick fruit and vegetables by a labour hire contractor operating at sites in the Lockyer Valley, Sunshine Coast and Bundaberg, in, all in Queensland. Uh, ultimately, proceedings were commenced in the Federal Circuit Court uh, and found that the company involved in it and one of its directors had breached the Fair Work Act by failing to pay minimum wages and leave entitlements. Some workers gave evidence that they had been subjected to very poor conditions through their employment, including inadequate accommodation, a lack of food and water, the withholding of passports and personal belongings, threats of deportation or police reports if they complain. And it's that last point um, that particularly migrant workers are subject to and which uh, often impedes them from making complaints about their treatment because they live in fear that they are going to be deported. And uh, as low as the, the money that they are being paid is, uh, often they are forced, due to circumstances in their own personal lives and their home environment, um, to stay here, earning very little money, but to sending it back home. And they are fearful of being deported if they make any complaints. Um, Senator Keneally has referred to the fact that members of this own government, including uh, the member for La Trobe, Mr Wood, uh, and the new member for Mallee, have actually highlighted this problem, highlighted the extreme exploitation that we're seeing uh, of people who are brought to Australia by plane, by organised crime syndicates, and this government is not doing anything about it. And why is that is the case? That's because Peter Dutton, Minister Dutton, is too busy running his political wedges and playing politics rather than actually properly oversighting his portfolio. Rather than the maladministration we continue to see from Minister Dutton, we need him to take some action to stop this outbreak 
uh, of the exploitation of migrant workers and exploitation of our borders by organised crime syndicates. We know that this government has a long history of failing migrant workers. Um, I, put, I congratulate the efforts uh, of a number of trade unions, particularly the National Union of Workers, um, soon to merge and form a new union, the United Workers Union. Uh, they have done a fabulous job in standing up for the rights of these migrant workers, but it, frankly, it shouldn't be up to unions to have to do this. This is something that is actually being caused by Minister Dutton's own Mel administration. He is responsible for this issue. He has every opportunity to put in place the right policies and the right regulatory authorities to ensure that people aren't inappropriately being brought to this country and then exploited uh, with the kind of conditions that we were talking about. This is another gross example of mal maladministration on Minister Dutton's part. The sooner that he stops playing politics and actually gets back to doing his job, the better. Thank you, uh, Senator Smith. Senator, uh, Senator, Watt, um, Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Well, this afternoon's debate, where Senator Keneally has moved in this place to, to take note of um, the answers, the non-answers and the failure to answer questions uh, in this place on notice is an important act. It is our job as senators to do our best to insist on those answers according to the rules of this place. But those answers are not being given in good spirit. Uh, in, in accordance with the expected conduct and responsibilities of this place. But why might this be so? Well, we know that the government has a lot they don't want to reveal in this space. They've absconded their portfolio responsibilities, Minister Dutton and Minister Coleman have, because all that you find in the answers to questions that you do receive is an absolute revelation and revealing of Australia's citizenship and visa mismanagement of these systems. So it's a little wonder they don't want to answer questions before this place. It is bad enough that the majority of uh, that the waiting time for the majority of visa applications has blown out. And so I wonder what the government might be holding on to uh, in refusing to answer these questions in a timely way. I hope they come prepared to estimates, as I know that Senator Keneally will be expecting them to be. But it is the right of this place to ask questions outside of estimates and for those questions to be answered uh, within the expected timeframes. So we have a government that has allowed the number of asylum claims uh, to blow out, and as Senator Keneally said, yes, people have an absolute right to claim asylum, but they need to be legitimate. And the people smuggle smugglers have changed their business model. The government has not put the people smugglers out of business. There are more people coming in uh, by air uh, claiming asylum than ever before, uh, but ultimately not being found to be asylum seekers <coughs> uh, and not having a well-founded fear of persecution. The Assistant Minister for Customs, Community Safety and Multicultural Affairs, Jason Wood. He himself has been forced to admit through the Parliamentary Joint Standing Committee on Migration in the last parliament. He has said that organised crime, illegitimate labour hire companies are using loopholes to bring out illegal workers who are often vulnerable and open to exploitation. This represents an orchestrated scam that enables these criminal elements to exploit foreign workers in Australia until their claims are finalised. Now, this is an appalling state of affairs that we have been fighting to lift the light on for uh, many years. It's certainly been in the, case, uh, the case in my time in uh, estimates committees and on the um, Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee that looks at migration issues in the Senate, that you have to fight tooth and nail for the information here uh, to support 
uh, and find out what's really going on for these vulnerable people. So we, th this particular report uh, previously tabled in the last parliament, um, months and years of dog whistling by Minister Dutton and those opposite, you can actually see the statistics revealed in this report, but also over many, many years of work done by the Labor opposition asking for the very kinds of data and statistic that Senator Keneally uh, has rightfully asked for. We know that in 14 15, 8,652 people lodged an application for protection visas. Uh, in 15 16, it was about 12,500. 16 17, 18, uh, more than 18,000. 17 18, here we go, 27,000. 18 19, 24,000. And so far this year, some 4,000 people. Now, we wouldn't know the answers to how many people are actually claiming, um, making applications for protection, be they valid or invalid protections, or the means by which they arrive, if it weren't for the powers of this parliament to ask the questions and seek to find out about what the government is doing. <laughs> It is our responsibility to ask those questions, but you refuse to answer them. Why? Why do you want to refuse to answer them? Because it reveals your absolute mismanagement of these issues. Some 95,000, or nearly 96,000, I'm sorry, protection visa applications under this term of government, under the tenure of Mr. Morrison when he was immigration minister, and then under Mr. Dutton and Mr. Coleman. So you don't want this kind of data revealed. Why? Because you prefer your um, uh, s small vox pop grabs where you can dog whistle and point the finger in an entirely different direction. But the data and the facts speak for themselves. All of these people arrived lawfully by air but with an average of some 51 per day since 2014. Now, all of this is evidenced in previous questions Labor has asked in this parliament. So it is little wonder that you are dragging your feet in being transparent and open <coughs> with this place. <coughs> Most of these applications are made by people, are not made by people with genuine refugee claims. 84 per cent or 62 per cent of those applications were refused by the department over the same period. And what we find now is evidence that while their claims are being processed, they're here uh, illegally accessing Australia's labour market. It's not like the government has done any, done any work to piece these pictures together to proactively say, what's wrong with our uh, immigration system uh, and how are we going to reform it? You have to be dragged kicking and screaming day after day through accountability in this place. But it's little wonder we have a department that has suffered through cuts and privatisation. Uh, they are about to get, uh, continue to get busier as they deal with this increased caseload. Some 4,000 people have made a claim for protection between the 1st of July 2019, this year, and the 31st of August. That was 4,000 people in just 62 days. Now, there's something very, very wrong going on here. Very few of these people are statistically are shown to have valid asylum claims, and we now therefore have a system where our visa system is letting in people, it's not preventing them from buying that ticket and getting on an aeroplane to start with, which is how the visa system is supposed to work. Um, they are arriving in Australia, making that claim when they get here because that gives them a valid reason to stay. And in the meantime, we know uh, that many of these people are being exploited in Australia's labour market. 
They're essentially, uh, in many cases, trafficked persons uh, who are being trafficked uh, because they consent to wanting to access Australia's labour market. They want to access Australia's labour market, um, so they consent to being trafficked in this way. But do they want to be exploited in the way that they are being? No. There's no tourism pamphlet handed out for come and work in Australia, uh, strawberry picking in Australia for $4 an hour. So we see that the government is on track to see 23 more than 23,000 claims for asylum in the 1920 financial year, with time being taken to process these claims and people having access to Australia's labour market in the meantime or not having access and working um, illegally. We are failing Australians by allowing huge blowouts in our migration system in this way. We have many people who are awaiting their legitimate claims for asylum in our country to be processed. Many legitimate claims for people who have fled dire circumstances, who are trapped in Australia in uncertain conditions because this department is swamped by the mismanagement of this government uh, in letting, out, letting in these many thousands of people by plane who are essentially being trafficked here uh, to access our labour market. We have more than 200,000 people on bridging visas uh, and we've reached record high levels of 230,000 in March this year. Now, that's a pretty uh, epic number of people given we're a nation of some 25 million people. But these statistics have blown out quarter on quarter, year on year, ever since Peter Dutton became the responsible minister back in 2014. <coughs> from June uh, 2018 to June uh, the th from, uh, to the next year, the number of people on bridging visas increased by 29,000 people. Since the coalition formed government in September 2013, it's increased by 93,000 people. So that's why we've now got this record high 230,000 people. And I've sat in estimates uh, looking at these statistics, and the government pretends that it's trying to clear this caseload, but the way you're going about it is statistically and mathematically impossible. We've had a bit of talk about stats and maths today for that to be the case. There is simply nothing you are doing that is seriously addressing this problem. I, you know, I've seen some of the arguments about what you're doing to accelerate uh, processing, but actually it is doing nothing to drill down into this bridging uh, visa uh, issue specifically. The government has attempted falsely to claim that the majority of people on bridging visas are part of the legacy caseload. And that is, as you like to say, you've stopped the boats, the legacy caseload of boat arrivals under Labor. But it is very, very clear the July report of this year into that legacy caseload says there are only 8,000 people with applications on hand or at review. 8,000 out of 230,000? I'm sorry. It's all very well for you to keep pointing, we've stopped the boats, we've stopped the, the boats. But for goodness sake, don't look over here at these 230,000 uh, people on bridging visas or the 50 people a day that are arriving in Australia to um, seek asylum, supposedly, but many of whom are actually um, being trafficked in uh, to access our labour market. So we have um, continued to uh, have a government that is completely missing in action on these issues. The appeals process, as at July 2019, um, the Migration uh, and Refugee Division, they had some 63,000 cases on hand 
40,000 of those are in migration and 23 in um, uh, the refugee division. And Malaysian Chinese nationals made up the majority of these lodgements. Now, some of these people uh, may not be genuine refugees uh, and will have their claims rejected, as we've discussed. But when you look at the true purpose of why they've sought to come here and claim that asylum, they are coming here to access our labour market and to work and they are absolutely susceptible to exploitation as workers. Now, this exploitation is happening right around the nation. It is quite happily in Western Australia at the moment, peak strawberry season. And as Senator Keneally said, what happens when you put pack fruit in your children's lunchbox? You know, we like to take pride in the um, ethical production of uh, agriculture in Australia. And I know our strawberries in Western Australia are grown locally and I love them. However, it is very clear that there is the exploitation of workers taking place in the metropolitan area, in Western Australia, in the strawberry growing areas, um, using exploited labour. Wanneroo uh, is one of those locations. It's not an eligible regional postcode for the purposes of the working holiday maker visa extension. So what this region is suffering through, because they're not an eligible area, they have this constantly rotating backpacker workforce. Just as you've trained someone up to pick strawberries, uh, they have to leave and go and get another job somewhere else. Because as a holiday maker, they're not entitled to stay longer for three months. So it's clear that what, what is going on in Wanneroo is that firms have been supplied undocumented workers or um, labour hire firms were not legally compliant in how they were paying workers. Now, if you had a more sustainable workforce, you would be able uh, to do something about that. I am um, very proud of my Labor colleagues in taking up the fight on this issue. It is not just um, these exploited workers that are suffering, it's everyone that is stuck in our overblown, uh, overburdened immigration system who cannot get their paperwork done. Whether it's someone wait waiting for a parental visa, whether it's someone um, uh, trying to uh, have family reunion. There are so many people that we deal with in our offices every day who, whose lives are intimately affected uh, by the decisions of the Department of Immigration. That burden would be a lot lighter if decisions could be made in a fair but, very importantly, in a timely manner. There is little prospect of things being timely with the kind of flooding of the immigration system that is taking place at the moment and the absolute mismanagement of it under this government. So, as we head towards estimates next week, you can be sure that we will be very fired up about these issues. You will be sure that we will be seeking accountability from the government. These issues not only affect uh, people inside immigration, but they affect all of us in the sense that we have very real labour and working conditions that are undermined by this loophole in our immigration system that is allowing essentially what looks to be perhaps hundreds of thousands of workers uh, potentially uh, working uh, without a valid asylum claim, but who are essentially here accessing the labour market. Now, people 100 per cent have a right to seek asylum in our nation and for it to be properly assessed. But we have procedures in our nation to make sure that people get a visa before they arrive here, if they need one. Where are those procedures? What on earth is happening? 
No wonder Senator Keneally is seeking your accountability uh, on these questions. So have no doubt there will be a lot more work to do in this place and uh, within the parliamentary committee system as a whole on these questions. Australians deserve answers and this Senate deserves them too. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, uh, Deputy uh, President. Well, accountability is sort of the, the hallmark of parliament. And of course, you'd expect that you know, questions put by Christina, Senator Christina Keneally to the Immigration, Citizenship, Migration Services and Multicultural Affairs on the 12th of the 8th, 2019, would be answered. You'd expect that there'd be an attempt to turn around and answer some very serious questions that are confronting the immigration and visa system and challenges that we're faced in this country. When in 2016, one of the questions were asked that when, to, when in 2016 did the minister first become aware of the current surge in asylum seeker applications from citizens of Malaysia? And when did the minister first become aware of the current surge of asylum seeker applications from citizens of China? A very fundamental, critical question on how the government is responding to weaknesses that are clearly appearing within our visa system. Now, you go to then the talking points that the government put out that you know, um, got released on the 14th of October, much to their uh, uh, surprise. A government that's been in power for six years states on one of their talking points on the 14th of October 2019 that their response to exploited workers such as the ones that were talked about in these questions raised by uh, Christina, Minister, uh, Senator Christina Keneally, their response was the answer should be the exploitation of any worker is Austra in Australia is something we have zero tolerance for. Now, zero tolerance for. This is what's happening at the moment regards migrant wage theft. Two thirds of migrant workers reported that their employer at one point or another has failed to provide a pay slip, with 44 per cent reporting they had never received a pay slip for their work. 28 per cent of workers in the hospitality industry had experienced their employer confiscating their passport. Almost a third of survey participants earn $12 per hour or less, some as little, of course, as $4. Of course, $12 per hour is approximately half the minimum wage for a casual employee. Almost half of participants earned $15 per hour or less. Now, these sources are from the Australian National Temporary Migrant Workers Survey by the Migrant Worker Justice Initiative from the University of New South Wales and UTS from November 2017. We've seen a situation where migrant workers are so grossly underpaid that in case of penalty rates, between 45 and 76 per cent of workers are underpaid or not paid penalty rates. 51 per cent of workers are not paid or underpaid for overtime. 60 per cent of workers do not have tax withheld by their employers. 39 per cent of workers have had entitlements withheld. And of course, that source is the ending wage theft report from the McKell Institute from March 2019. But don't worry, the government has an answer. Not an answer to questions, not an answer to serious matters raised by Senator Keneally. They have an answer. The exploitation of any worker in Australia is something we have zero tolerance for. In the 2018 Harvest Trial, uh, trial where there were investigations carried out by the Fair Work, they found 150 formal cautions they issued, 132 infringement notices, totalling 155,390. Of course, they started then going through a number of companies. These are the companies that they, they they discovered that were ripping off migrant workers. This is just a few. Let us grow hyperponic, uh, hyper, uh, uh, hydroponics, agricultural limited, recovered $37,781 for four employees. TDS International Investment, $92,381. 
$40,000 was recovered from Growmore Enterprises. Maritio Sunshine, $186 penalty against the company and $41,300 against sole director Mr Banny. But has that had any effect in dealing with these thieves? You know, I always re you know, recall John Howard, and of course we hear this from the Conservatives too, too many times. We will decide who comes into this country. Well, Minister Dutton and Prime Minister Morrison are in effect saying criminals, wage thieves, organised crime, human traffickers will decide who comes into this country because they are the ones that profit from it and the government's policies are the ones that encourage it. Lack of accountability, lack of answers is because they simply don't care about what's happened to the Australian community. When these migrants get exploited, when wages are stolen, when criminal gangs operate, that steals from decent employers that employ people correctly. It steals from people that are turning around and doing the right thing. It steals from Australians who are looking for jobs. Fundamentally, this government has to be held to account for its obligations, obligations to the Australian community, obligations to Australian workers and obligations to migrant workers that find themselves working within this country. I always find it amusing when the government turns around and says, and, and rightly, in actual fact, I think we all share this view, that when people come to this country, and particularly when visa holders come to this country, there's an opportunity to have quid pro quo. And that, that, that sense is about people having a good experience here. You know, people that, particularly students, that might go on to carry on other careers back in their home countries, have an experience about what Australia is like. Well, what Australia is like under this government is wage theft. What Australia is like under this government is people not turning around and making a difference, let alone answering the questions that can make the difference. Because when you answer the questions, it drives results, it drives accountability, and that's what this parliament is for. Oh, Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I just want to say a few words in uh, finishing off this taking note debate. Uh, and uh, thank uh, Senators uh, Smith, uh, Mario Smith, that is, uh, Senator uh, Sheldon, Senator Watt, uh, Senator Pratt for their participation in this debate and the observations they have made, the contributions they have made to this take no debate. I would also like to uh, put on the record my appreciation to Senator Ciccone, who hosted and organized the uh, roundtable we held uh, about airplane arrivals and uh, labor shortages. Uh, and labour demand in the horticulture sector in Shepparton uh, only last week and, uh, and, and put on the record my appreciation for the work that he has done in advocating for uh, migrant workers, exploited workers and indeed for all Australian workers to have fair wages and conditions. I began uh, this Take No Debate observe making some observations about maths uh, and it, yet while it was a um, a perhaps more light-hearted start to this conversation. This, the subject is incredibly serious, and I do acknowledge Senator Sheldon for his contribution in bringing us home to the seriousness of the problem and some of the devastating maths, uh, some of the devastating numbers uh, that uh, affect uh, exploited workers in Australia. Again, as I said in my remarks, this is not the fair go that we understand Australia to be, uh, and the condition of exploited workers, uh, particularly in the horticulture sector, is not something most Australians would, um, would tolerate, as Senator Pratt observed, uh, indeed would find ethical. Uh, and I do think the parents of Australia uh, would find it quite concerning if they had information where the fruit and veg they buy for their families uh, comes from, who picks it, and the uh, exploitative conditions under which those people work. Uh, you know, yesterday, the government started the day by accidentally leaking their talking points to the entire press gallery. They finished last night by losing a vote in the Senate on national security legislation, and today they have proved that they cannot answer even basic questions about uh, asylum seekers, about the numbers who are arriving through our airports, or indeed. Uh, Indeed, they can offer no plan for how they're going to address this problem, how they're going to secure our borders, how they're going to protect 
uh, as Senator Sheldon said, those people who come to our country uh, to have a positive experience, and nor are they going to <coughs> prepare to do much to work with the horticultural sector to ensure a steady and fair uh, supply of workers uh, or uh, do much about lifting wages and conditions across the economy. They, intend, they seem intent on allowing to develop under their watch a working population, a, sorry, an economy that is based on a working population made up of temporary migrants who are paid extremely low wages and subject to exploitative conditions. Uh, right now we have two million people in Australia who have, no who have no path to permanency and no stake in the future of the country. They are locked out of the wages, conditions, laws. Uh, that protect the rest of the country, based on the government's own projections on temporary migration, that's going to increase to three million people. That changes the composition of our country. That changes the composition of our economy. Uh, and all of us should care very deeply about the, uh, the path this government is taking us on, because whether we are here uh, on a visa, whether we are here permanently, whether we are uh, working uh, with, with good wages and conditions, or we, want to, or we are struggling, whether we have children or not, we all have a stake in the future of this country in an economy that is built on people being able to access a living wage, uh, to access protections at work, to access safety, uh, to access uh, fair work conditions. Uh, whether, and this is, um, this is really what is at stake here. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, just before I wrap up, I would like to acknowledge another uh, math statistic. This one also not very happy, uh, and I would ask the indulgence of the Chamber in letting me switch subjects slightly. Today is International Pregnancy and Infant Loss Day, and I know there is a motion before the Senate later tonight, uh, and I acknowledge it is supported across the crossbench and the government. Uh, the depressing statistic about that is that there are six stillborn babies every day in Australia. There are 2,200 stillborn babies a year, and that is a number that has not changed in 20 years, despite all of the advances that we have made in this country in terms of um, maternal health. I'd like to acknowledge in the public gallery uh, the director of the Stillbirth Center for Research Excellence, Professor Vicki Flannity, and her team who were here earlier. Uh, earlier today, uh, Vicki and her team, with Minister Hunt and with, the, um, with uh, Mr. Chris Bowen, the Shadow Minister for Health, uh, launch the Safer Baby Bundle. And I want to end on a more positive form of maths, and that is this, that uh, the Safer Baby Bundle sets a target to save, to, to reduce the number of preventable stillbirths by 20 percent. That would mean some 200 babies' lives saved every year in Australia. Uh, I am quite hopeful uh, that we can surpass that with a range of other measures as well. But the Safer Baby Bundle launched today with funding uh, from the government backed in by the recommendations of this Senate, this very Senate stillbirth uh, inquiry, uh, has what has led to today's uh, announcement. Uh, and I am really quite pleased that Vicky's in the chamber today, and I am very, um, very delighted that today we launched the Safer Baby Bundle. And I thank all members of the Senate, because it was your support for the Senate Select Committee into Stillbirth that made that possible. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Keneally. Uh, Senator Billick, are you moving? Are you speaking on Senator Keneally's uh, motion? No, I'm taking note on other. Uh, we've just got a little okay. bit to do before that. Uh, the question is that the uh, Senate take note of the motion put by Senator Keneally. All those in favour, say aye. aye. All those against, say no. The ayes have it. Are there any motions to take note of answers, Senator Billick? Thank you so much. I rise to take note of answers given today by Senators Payne, Cash and Colbeck to questions asked by opposition Senators Farrell, Polly and Pratt. And can I just begin by saying what another disappointing question time it was. Couldn't get clear answers from those on the other side whatsoever. Australia is in the midst of a skills crisis brought about by the Liberal government's $3 billion in cuts to TAFE and training. And what we get from the other side is um, a little lecture about a lecture. Uh, you know, it must have been in the speaking notes today. I don't think they were leaked today, but I'm presuming they were in the speaking notes because I noticed a couple of um, ministers on that side used the same lines about they won't be lectured to. Well, let me tell you this. 
skills and us asking questions about skills and apprenticeships and traineeships is not lecturing. It's asking questions. And if we ask questions, we should be able to get an answer. In Tasmania, and as a Tasmanian, um, I know that the Morrison government's cuts to TAFE and training has hit particularly hard. Premier Will Hodgman and Treasurer Peter Gutwin are crowing about a so-called golden age in Tasmanians, but I'll tell you, few Tasmanians <coughs> share their optimism. We've lost 1,190 apprentices and trainees since the Liberals came to government federally. That's a drop of 12.5 per cent. But the minister failed to highlight this in her answers yesterday. And then today, she once again dodged the question when she was asked the question about why she didn't answer that or why she didn't put that in her answers yesterday. So um, they're pretty good at dodging answers, but they're not very good at giving answers. And there is a difference. There is a difference, and the people of Tasmania, in particular, deserve to know about why there's been such a reduction in trainees and apprentices. We know that the skills shortage is particularly acute in Tasmania. Tasmania has lost 5,600 full-time jobs over the past 12 months. And the trouble for Tasmanians is that we're faced with a Liberal government at both state level and federal level, and neither of them, neither of them believe in TAFE. And they never have. Never have. Youth unemployment is 14.3 per cent in Tasmania, and it's harder for young people to get work in Tasmania than in any other state. And I must be hitting the right note here because Senator Dunnian's trying to interject. Either that or he's talking to himself, but I'll, I think he's actually trying to interject. Um, Senator Dunnian, you've been here a while now. You know my line on that. I've worked with three-year-olds. I worked with three-year-olds for 12 years. You can interject all you want. I still don't hear, to be honest. I still don't hear. So, when that, and, and, and just this week, just now as we do this, in Tasmania, Premier Hodgman will not commit to not cutting um, the Launceston CBD campus of TAFE, which is under threat of closure. Even today, Premier Hodgman would, would not respond to that. He would not rule out the closures. It's um, fairly strange, I think, that Senator Hodgman will back a proposal to, um, uh, to move the um, university in Launceston, but he won't actually come out and say that he won't t uh, cut the TAFE out of Launceston. I don't know where really he gets his advice from, but I'm saying he really needs to look at what he's doing. And to be honest, I'd be interested to find out what he plans he's got for the um, building in, in Launceston that he's planning to move TAFE out of. Under Will Hodgman's government, TAS TAFE has been plagued by course cancellations and delays, chronic staff shortages and inadequate infrastructure. And I'll say this again and again and again. Tasmania has lost 5,600 full-time jobs in the past year and has a youth unemployment rate that is so much higher than anywhere else. And given these appalling statistics, northern Tasmania needs a strong investment in TAFE, in, in the infrastructure for TAFE, including maintaining that city campus. But instead of postponing and under-resourcing trades and traineeships, both the state and federal governments must commit to complete courses in TAFE in Tasmania for the benefit of Tasmanians. Now, let's quickly look at what's happening with Tasmanian women who are not taking up apprenticeships or traineeships. And data has showed that 3,345 females in training in 2014. As of September 2018, there was 2,600 apprentices and trainees. So no matter how you guys on that side want to spin it, that's a pretty big loss. This government, both at state and federal level, in regard to TAFE, in regard to apprenticeships, in regard to traineeships, has completely dropped the ball. You're leaving Tasmania's Tasmanians unskilled and you're leaving them unable to get work, and that is simply not acceptable. Uh, Senator Rennick, thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. It is extremely hypocritical for the Labor Party to be criticising the Liberal Party and the LNP about youth jobs. In my home state of Queensland, the Queensland State Labor Government has shut down three agricultural colleges in Dolby, Emerald, and Henshambrook. Shame, shame. What better way 
to create jobs for the uh, jobs for the youth, for jobs to look after the environment, and they've done this in the middle of the, one of the worst droughts in the last century. They've done this in the middle of one of the worst droughts in the last century. Dolby's on its knees, Emerald's on its knees, and what do you do? You shut down agricultural colleges, and you have got the height to come in here and criticise the Liberal government for what? Investing three billion dollars in the vet, vet sector and compare that to what Federal Labor did in 2012-2013. They took away 85,000 apprenticeships. 85,000 apprenticeships. We won't be taking any lectures on skills from Labor after spending the past six years fixing the mess that they've left behind in our vet sector. The greatest fall in apprenticeship numbers on record occurred in 2012-2013 when the number of apprenticeships and trainee commencements fell by 85,000 places in a single year. Senator Wong, the member for Sydney, the member for McMahon and the Leader of the Opposition were sitting around the Cabinet table at that time and did nothing. The member for Rankin, Jimmy, Jimmy's down, was Chief of Staff to the Treasurer and did nothing. Over just two years, all the same faces opposite gutted over $1.2 billion from employer incentives to take on apprenticeships. Nine times in two years, the Labor Party wielded the knife against apprenticeship incentives. Every time they needed a cut, they went straight for apprenticeships. This is the consequence of a Labor government that could not control their spending. And when the Leader of the Opposition was Deputy Prime Minister, he, along with Senator Wong as Finance Minister and Mr Bowen as Treasurer, cut over $240 million out of apprenticeship incentives in a single year. And how much noise did the member for Cooper raise at the time while leading the ACTU? Nothing. But this is just the beginning of the mess that Labor left behind, the mess that has taken us six years to fix. Of all the damage, all the damage the Labor Party did to this sector, nothing did more to damage the vocational sector than their vet fee help changes. And wasn't that a debacle? This program saw thousands of students exploited, exploited by unscrupulous providers as a direct result of Labor's poorly designed reforms to this program. Since 2016, over 37,000 students have had help, vet fee help loan debts recredited by the Commonwealth. That's right. Madam Deputy President, we have been the ones to bail out our youth here. We are the ones looking after the youth after they were thrown under a bus by Labor. No government in good conscience could allow this behaviour to flourish, but the Labor Party let it happen. Repairing this disastrous program has been an ongoing agenda item across all three terms of this government. The total cost to date of repairing this unconscionable program has totaled just 250 has, has totaled just under $250 million. And this is a cost to the taxpayer. Madam Deputy President, a cost to the taxpayer of fixing this problem. However, this government is committed to ensuring Australians have the right skills for the workforce of today and the future. In this financial year, we are investing over $3 billion in VET, which includes $1.5 billion given to the states and territories every year through the National Agreements on Skills and Workforce Development Specific Purpose Payment. Despite that, Despite Queensland receiving generous amounts of money from the federal government, they still can't keep those agricultural colleges open, despite the fact they always talk about the environment. You made a big song and dance today about jobs for the youth. Well, where were you when the agricultural colleges were being closed down? Nowhere. Didn't care. The federal government's putting $1.1 billion to fund the government's own school programs, including employer incentives and support for Australian apprenticeships. The government's skills packages is contributing to an increase in Commonwealth funding to VET over the budget forward estimates. Over the period of 2018 to 22, funding from the Commonwealth to the states remains stable at around $1.7 billion a year. Funding for Commonwealth's own programs is expected to increase each year over the budget forward estimates to over $1.3 billion by 2022-23. We have commenced work to establish a new Thank skills. Thank you, Senator yeah. Rennick. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, in question time today, uh, with Senator Colbeck's uh, answers to questions, the plight of Australia's young people um, has been 
well and truly revealed. We know that Australian young people have very high rates of youth unemployment currently, and yet all the government can do is point the finger towards programs that are demonstrably failing. So you take, for example, the question that Senator Smith asked um, uh, this afternoon <coughs> in relation to uh, the rate of youth unemployment. And we see here that we have a growing rate of youth unemployment in many places around the nation. We have uh, the government has set claim that they are injecting 100,000 new jobs uh, for young people into the system over the last 12 months. Well, the distressing fact is there are 260,000 young Australians unemployed. And, that's simple, and of course, in that period, people will move in and out of the labour market. What that demonstrates with 260,000 young people unemployed and more than 600,000 um, underemployed, that 100,000 jobs particularly uh, um, will go no way to addressing that issue, particularly as young people um, uh, age out of being young and a new generation of young people uh, move out of their school age years. There is a structural problem here that is growing and it is deeply connected to other trends in the economy. What happens when youth unemployment rises? Well, it's very much interlinked with wage stagnation uh, in Australia. As the Grattan Institute report uh, quoted in these questions reveals, it says slower wage growth particularly hurts young people. Unlike older people, they are less likely to have other sources of income and so rely more on wages. It goes on to talk about how people who enter the workforce at a time of low wage growth are particularly hurt because they miss out on the stronger wage progress people normally make in their first decade in the workforce. So this government has been giving excuses and twiddling its thumbs on the question of wage growth in Australia, frankly, for years now. For years, you'll point to, oh, you've created more jobs, the economy is continuing to grow, but you absolutely do not deal with the economic fundamentals uh, in question, which is that people's take-home household income is declining, that wage growth has declined and that you have no strategy for addressing this. Indeed, the pa very PATH program that you have been lauding in your answers that we've critiqued in our questions, you can see that only 30 per cent of PATH participants had have been offered a job at the, uh, the end of their internship. That is a disgraceful set of figures and shows that this program really isn't working. You, you can see in this case, I, I guess what's likely to be happening is that actually employers are relying on the wage subsidy uh, in order to justify taking on these placements. Now, you know, I, I can see that there can be a role for wage subsidies, but there has to be decent and reliable employment uh, uh, available to young people and all Australians uh, so that they can meet their cost of living needs. But what we see in Australia is a growing number of young people who are in economic distress and cannot meet their basic cost of living. The very same report, the Grattan Institute's Generation Gap, uh, ensuring a fair go for younger Australians. You know, it's talked about pretty basic issues like food security, about the number of young people that don't have enough income to feed themselves. Now, these issues are Senator intrinsically Pratt, your time is interlinked. Expired.
Senator Stoker. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. It really is quite rich that we have had both a question time and a take note period in which um, those opposite have carried on about um, this government's performance on the youth employment and skills front when their record is something about which they should hang their head in shame. So let's get a few facts on the record because, quite frankly, they speak for themselves. We heard an awful lot about apprenticeships in the course of Question Time today. They carried on as though apprenticeships were high under Labor and they've plummeted low under the coalition. And you know what? Nothing could be further from the truth. The greatest fall in apprentice numbers on record, not just now, not just last week, last year, on record, the entire time we've been keeping track of these things, occurred under the former Labor government in 2012 to 13, when the number of apprenticeships and trainee commencements fell by 85 thousand 85 thousand Senator Scar in a single year and Senator Wong member for McMahon they were all members of cabinet at the time that very same time they cut over 240 million dollars out of apprenticeships that same single year and did we hear them bleating and carrying on like they have been today no, no, no. It's one standard for them and a different standard for everybody else. And that's the kind of two faced hypocrisy we have, as Australian people, simply had enough of. And I could go on for an awfully long time about the damage they did to that sector. The changes they made to vet fee help saw thousands of students being exploited by unscrupulous providers, and they were a direct result of the poor governance that existed in Labor's poorly designed reforms to that program. It has led, since 2016, to the Commonwealth having to re-credit vet fee-help loans to 37,000 students. So egregious was their exploitation. They were vulnerable students systemically exploited, while dodgy providers who flourished under the no-rules environment that the Labor Party had in place pocketed the lot. And no sensible, responsible government could possibly allow that to flourish, and yet that's exactly what they did. So we have reformed that program, and we are continuing to drive improvement in that sector. Since we started making changes in that area in 2014 to 15, it has saved over $1.8 billion each and every year. That's what good governance will do for you. That is what an approach that cares about outcomes for people who are seeking work will do. And with about 300,000 additional jobs created by the private sector, in the year 2018 to 19, we have seen employment grow by 2.6 per cent. Now, that might not sound like an enormous number, but it's well above the 1.5 per cent growth forecast that was in the budget, and it is accompanied by a whole range of economic indicators that stand out as leading the way while the rest of the world is struggling with difficult economic headwinds. Across the economy, you know, we'd love for wages to be enormous, but here's, here's the key indicator. They increased in excess of inflation. Inflation was steady at 1.6 per cent, and wages increased by 2.3 per cent. And so in circumstances where there is a small increase in wages, Australians are, in real wage terms, getting ahead, the ways we need to look about Maximising opportunity for Australians is to ensure that their cost of living doesn't get too high, that they can afford the cost of all the things around them, and that there are lots and lots of job opportunities from which to choose. And that is exactly what the coalition government is providing. We are doing it day in, day out, and whether that is by boosting apprenticeships by 85,000, whether it's by subsidising and incentivising key skill shortage areas, 
the PATH program. We are bringing opportunity Thank to you, Australians who need it most. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Deputy President. Well, what we've heard uh, this afternoon from this government is that this is a government that has no plan for good jobs. It has no plan to support the TAFE training system. It has no plan to get wages moving in this country. And it has no plan to create opportunity for young Australians to get into work. When asked how the government has managed to preside over a skills shortage and wage stagnation at the same time, uh, which is quite the achievement, Senator Payne said that the government is, and I quote, absolutely committed on skills shortages. The minister says the government is investing in vocational training. And when asked about chronically low wage growth in this country under this government, Minister Payne said, there's no problem, everything's okay. She says Australians are looking forward to a future of opportunity. Well, yes, they are, but not while this government is in office. Because the reality of their record is not quite as rosy as the government would have you believe. It truly seems that they think that if they can say everything is fine enough times, it might actually just become true. But the truth is that this is a government with absolutely no plan. They have no plan to deal with the significant issues facing our, facing our economy and facing our country. And their lack of leadership is really hurting Australians today. Because wage growth is at record lows. In some sectors, it's not just that people's wages aren't going up, they are actually going backwards in real terms. With the most recent wage growth figures at just 2.3 per cent, this government's record on wages growth is absolutely abysmal. Economists and just about every other person in the country are screaming out that wage growth needs boosting. <coughs> we need a plan to get wages moving in this country, and we need that both to kickstart our flagging, faltering economy, and we need it to help Australian families that are struggling with the rising cost of living. Everything is going up in this country at the moment except for people's wages and families are struggling. But you wouldn't know that from the answers that the government gave us today. It's obvious that this government just doesn't care, like it didn't care when it stood by and allowed over 700,000 retail, fast food, hospitality and pharmacy workers to have their penalty rates cut. Penalty rate cuts that have not delivered a single new job in this country, despite the government's claims, and penalty rate cuts that cut the pay of some of Australia's lowest paid workers. And let's think about the answers that Senator Cash gave to questions today uh, about apprenticeships. When asked what's happening to apprenticeships, which have dropped by 12 per cent in Tasmania under this government, Senator Cash took the opportunity uh, to talk about Senator Watt uh, and to gloat again uh, about the election result. And she, she showed absolutely no care for apprentices in Tasmania or around the country today. Uh, and what can I say about Senator Colbeck's attempted answers to our questions? Uh, when asked about youth unemployment blowing out to almost 12 per cent uh, and hundreds of thousands of young Australian workers who are underemployed, the uh, aptly named Minister for Youth, Senator Colbeck, said everything's under control. Um, but everything is not under control with this government. Uh, in fact, this government has cut $3 billion from our TAFE sector—$3 billion from our TAFE and training sector. And today, uh, we have 150,000 fewer apprentices and trainees than when the Liberals were elected in 2013. Today we have 150,000 fewer apprentices and trainees than when the Liberals were elected in 2013. They have cut and cut and cut. 
And today in Australia there are around 260,000 unemployed young people and many, many more thousands of underemployed young people. It's time that this government got a plan to get wages moving and Thank support you, young workers Senator today. Walsh. Um, the question is that the uh, Senate take note of the motion put by Senator Billick. All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise uh, today to uh, reflect on the uh, questions given to this place uh, from Senator Cormann, representing the Prime Minister, uh, to the questions that I was asking uh, in relation to this government's uh, proposal to spend more taxpayers' money uh, building more dams in places such as uh, New South Wales. And while I'm standing here on my feet, Madam Acting Deputy President, we know, of course, that the New South Wales state government uh, has just announced uh, that they are going to move ahead with watering down, uh, excuse the pun, uh, slashing environmental protections and assessments uh, to build new dams and new pipelines, all in a big rush uh, to look as though they're doing something uh, in relation to the crippling drought uh, which we're experiencing uh, throughout the Murray-Darling Basin. Well, of course, the big problem here uh, is that simply building dams doesn't make it rain. Building dams doesn't create more water. In fact, what happens is that we are going to spend, see this government spending uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayers' money building dams which will further destroy uh, the Murray-Darling Basin River system, further destroy uh, those farming communities throughout the basin because it won't be the community and it won't be the river that gets access to this water that is harvested and stored. And we know that because the rules in New South Wales uh, around allocation are an absolute joke. They give a priority to big corporate irrigation over the needs of the community and the environment. So we're going to see buckets of taxpayers' money spent on dams that are not going to be assessed for their environmental impact. There's no cost-benefit analysis. The water is going to be harvested, and then in three or four years' time, we're going to be back to where we were. This is an absolute disaster. We are facing um, a continually drying climate. We are in the midst of a climate emergency, and all we get from this government is pray for rain. That's the only plan they have. Building dams won't make it rain. And having a drought plan with no plan for climate change means you've got nothing at all. This government is up Crack Creek without a paddle right now. There's no water in the river. They can't get themselves out of it, so they're willing to just splash around money and pretend, hoping that the community, the farmers and uh, the uh, taxpayers won't notice. It is absolute disgrace that this government, uh, despite all of the heartache that is going on in river communities, we've got towns that don't have clean, uh, clean water. You can't turn on the tap and take a glass of water to drink. We've got farmers, small family farmers, who don't have enough water to water their stock or their crops. Meanwhile, big corporate irrigators continue to store water and irrigate at the expense of everybody else, and the river is in crisis. We saw those uh, millions of fish that were dead in the uh, Menindee Lake system over summer. Just in the last 48 hours, there has been another uh, mass fish death sighted, um, and it's not, even, it's not even December yet. We are in October. Uh, the, this summer is going to be hotter and drier. Uh, we know that. That's what the scientists are telling us. That's what the uh, Bureau of Meteorology is telling us. Um, it is going to be the summer of death, the summer of death for the Murray-Darling Basin, for those communities that are being given no hope from this government and saying, just wait a few years, we'll spend the taxpayers' money, we'll build some dams and, fingers crossed, we pray hard enough, it'll start raining. It is not a plan for drought. It is not a plan for climate action. And, in, and instead, uh, we are just hanging our uh, family farms and river communities out to dry, and all the while doing the bidding of big corporate interests by slashing and burning environmental regulation, 
spending taxpayers' money while we do it, and I can guarantee that in three or four years' time the river is going to be in a worse situation, not a better one, because this government did nothing about it. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day?